It's November 7th, 2022. Thank you for joining us both in person in Conchoice Auditorium and online for the Burlington City Council meeting. The time is uh, 5.09. Um, we'll begin our meeting with a call to order um, and a motion to adopt the agenda. Uh, Councillor Carpenter. I would move to adopt the agenda as posted. Thank you, Councillor Carpenter. Is there a second to that motion? Second. Uh, seconded by Councillor McGee. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, favor, of, the, uh, favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. And that means we have an agenda. So the first item on the agenda is um, for the second item on the agenda is item 2.0, which is a work session on redistricting. Um, for those who are watching online, you can stay on the same Zoom link. Uh, we're gonna move our meeting from Conchoice to go downstairs to the Busher Conference Room. Um, and we have with us downstairs, Nancy Stetson is already downstairs, and we have the, our planning director, Megan Tuttle, who is online with us this evening. And, um, we, according to our agenda, will reconvene the council meeting um, after the work session, or we will continue the meeting after the work session at approximately 6.30. So um, take us a couple of minutes to get downstairs. Councillor Freeman is joining us online. Um, uh, it'll take us a couple of minutes to get ourselves downstairs, but we will join you there. Thanks. Thank you. Did you want to, did the two of you want to sort of give us an, um, sort of a, an overview of what we have, the maps that we have, and, um, you know, we can go from there. And Ali is just coming in. Ali, we have not even started. We're just getting going. Uh, yes, President Paul, we were thinking that we could very briefly just share an overview to kind of where we left off from the last work session and what has been provided on board docs for you and then give you all the time um, to ask us questions. I do have the maps up and I'm happy to share my screen and use that to zoom in and out on different options if it's helpful in the discussion. Um, so we don't have any formal slides, but just maybe a few comments for you to start off. Okay. Okay, so... Um, at your last work session, there was a motion that was supported to move forward with an eight ward map option, understanding that that eight ward map would also include four districts. So the work that Nancy has done since that meeting um, has been responsive to a number of different questions and ideas about how the eight ward map could be approached. So the package of maps that was provided to you and an additional map that was posted this afternoon um, presents to you four different approaches for how we could consider uh, an eight ward map. Um, one of the considerations that we talked about at the end of the last work session was the kind of role of the on-campus populations and really the outsized role that small portions of those campuses could play in forming the boundaries of the wards that include them. Uh, so these four map iterations provide you four different kind of options for how we think about approaching the on-campus student population. Uh, the memo that was posted for you, and we can talk about each one of these if you'd like, um, each results in sort of a different outcome in terms of the overall uh, number of on-campus students that are in the different wards. Um, and the map that was posted for you this afternoon, the kind of fourth take on this, is an iteration of a lot of the things that uh, you'll see in other maps, except that it really tries to present mm -hmm. another option for your consideration that keeps uh, any ward's population to less than 50% uh, on-campus students. So for a couple of these, you'll see that there may be one or two versions. Um, these are typically just minor iterations of one another. Um, things, Questions that we've had or opportunities that we've seen um, for how the boundaries can be um, nuanced, uh, but there's just the four basic concepts for your consideration. 
And I think from each of these concepts, if there's one that is supported, we can talk about any nuances to that concept that may be possible from that. Um, so ultimately that's what we're looking for your feedback on tonight is uh, which of these concepts you feel you, may, you might want to move forward with. Um, and then from there, we should also talk a bit about uh, how the districts could be assembled with the wards. So maybe you could just give us a brief overview either, well, Nancy, there's no one who knows these maps like you do. Um, if there is, you know, just sort of a, you know, you've got the, it, well, at, at first, before we had all these communications, and just so everyone knows, there was a, as we all know, there were a number of people who communicated with us by email, and I reached out to each one of them asking if they wanted their comments posted for public record. Um, it seemed to make more sense to put them all here as opposed to on the consent agenda, since we're doing this first. Um, uh, so, you know, it's, it's a little bit of a crowded public content area, but, and the maps were arranged in a certain way. Now they're sort of a little, it's a little bit harder to follow, but if you could sort of give us an idea, it seems like there's really, as you say, three versions and how those what those versions, which each version sort of does, sort of. Sure. Yeah, so that's great. Go ahead, Nancy. I'll flip through the maps as you're talking. Okay. So yeah, the, the three or four versions that we're looking at, what the, the variation between them is both how the athletic campus is split up and then where board eight ends up on the map. Um, so the first uh, set of maps are called Ward 8 to Central Hill, which just means sort of centered on that Buell Street area. Um, and in both of those maps, well, in one of those maps, Ward 8 takes the entirety of Athletic Campus, and in the other, um, Ward 1 takes some of Athletic Campus, and Ward 8 takes the rest. Um, in the maps called Ward 8 to North Hill, um, Ward 8 does not take any Athletic Campus, and it shifts north to the Henry Loomis area, um, and takes that piece of the city, and uh, Ward 1 gets some of the, or the majority of the athletic campus. And then uh, in, oh, and those two variations are, are, they're quite close together. There's just a few blocks around Edmonds that shift between those two versions. Um, the next map is called Ward 8 to downtown, and again, Ward 8 doesn't take any athletic campus. It shifts towards the waterfront and becomes a an actual downtown ward. Um, and again, it all in this map it takes all of Champlain College as well. And then this map was added today. Um, this map. In this map, Ward 8 also doesn't take any athletic campus, but it instead um, takes that big block on the central campus of UVM, which includes two dorms and about 800 residents. Um, and then uh, Ward 3 adds the Buell Street um, neighborhood. And then Ward 8 also adds in a few blocks of Champlain. And Nancy, um, would it be helpful in terms of thinking about how each, I mean, all of these options that have been provided are within the allowable deviation. Um, some of them are much closer to the overall 10% allowable deviation. Uh, some of them are closer to nine or maybe even a little under nine, I think. Um, but they all have different approaches in terms of the percent of the population in wards that um, our on-campus students. So uh, Nancy, could you just remind us, um, thinking about kind of balance and um, which of these map options helps uh, keep the on-campus population in each ward less than 50%? So, um, so sure, I can just, the maps that keep it at less than 50%, um, include the Ward 8 to Central Hill version 2. Um, and uh, the the one that was added today, um, the Ward 8 with uh, UVM campus. And both of those have no ward has more than 50% on campus students. 
And we did do some work over the weekend to get um, better counts for Champlain. And so I um, just spoke in the past hour, added another um, document that has population totals, but that's the only difference between them. It just, it adds in this new map and it adjusts the, the on-campus percent very slightly based on those counts. So that that document is a PDF that's posted on board docs um, that is called population totals with updated in the title. I think if there's anything else that anybody would like to know about these different maps, we're happy to put one or um, any one of them up and allow for a discussion. So I think probably the easiest way potentially to, to address this is that we have effectively three approaches, um, the Central Hill, the North Hill, and the Downtown. Um, if there is some level of consensus, not necessarily in which specific map, but if there's any consensus in what we don't want, that might be a that might be a better place to start. Um, I don't know if people have an opinion one way or the other about one that they don't like, or if we wanna talk about the ones that we do like. Um, it's either process of elimination or just going for the one that we like. I'll, I will, this is a work session, so I'll, I'll say something. Um, I think the, uh, I think the, the goal of the Central Hill maps was, a, was a, 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 a laudable one. It was to try to um, make it so that we did not have uh, an overwhelming number of, you know, on campus. Um, and as we know, you know, fairly, fairly inaccessible student population in any one ward. Um, and that seemed, I think, like a, a good idea. I, I, I personally still think it's a good idea, but I don't think this is the way to get there. Um, it, it, to some degree, and others have said this, it sort of replicates uh, what we were trying to get away from, which is the, um, I don't know, I, I don't call it the salamander look, but because this one doesn't have as much of a tail, but it doesn't, it, it doesn't have that contiguousness block type look. And, um, you know, and so for that reason, personally, I would be fine with letting that map go. I would agree with um, what President Paula said. Um, these maps, they look contrived. Um, they look very much like the map we have now, and, and I think they would have many of the same issues around um, engagement and participation that we have now. Um, I will say that it looks more like Massachusetts version. Uh, <laughs> version one. It looks like Cape Coast. That looks like Cape Cod. No, yeah, Cape Coast. Right, like that. <laughs> but yes, I don't think it's it's a it's a it's a good map to move forward with, except for um, those characteristics that you mentioned that are more in the mainstream But I'm okay, not appropriate. Are there other opinions about this map, version one or version two? Um, I think that. Uh, that central, the central hills do um, deal with the issues related to um, uh, to Ward One. You know, I, I represent uh, Ward Two, and these are closest to um, what uh, what we have now. It obviously goes into Ward Three, but uh, for the old North End um, and contiguous one, I think that these. Um, make the most sense in terms of this long term um, uh, composition 
uh, Ward 2 um, and it's containment in it with Ward 3, so for the old Ward down. So um, I actually lean towards these and uh, um, unfortunately, Zariah is not here to represent the, the, the folks in, the, in Ward 1, but uh, uh, this map does keep places like Brooks Ave and Loomis, that Henry Street area, um, part of Ward 1. And uh, uh, I, since I've been involved in uh, Burlington politics at this level uh, in the, uh, the mid-1980s, that has always been part of it, and I, I think it's a very important part. So, um, the, uh, the the maps that uh, sever that section from uh, from Ward One, that's I'm not inclined to support. Sarah, um, yeah. the only thing this, but we keep seeming to forget that we created Ward A, we, we made up a new neighborhood and we did that on purpose, whatever that was, 10 years ago. And nobody nobody wants to own the neighborhood. Um, and well, we have it, we agreed to eight wards, we've all said we want eight wards. So I think we have to stop thinking so much about Seven wards, like the conversation about well, what did Ward One have or Ward Six have? When we were seven wards, we have eight wards, and that's just um, changes the neighborhood configuration. It is unfortunate that we have to call it Ward Eight because we didn't have a great success with Ward Eight that we created last time, but that's what we've got. So I just want us to keep focusing on. We have created a new neighborhood on purpose so that we can have eight wards. Um, that's what we've done. And so not everybody can stay in their old ward that they used to be in when we had seven wards because we've got eight wards. So um, maybe we should have called them A, B, C, D, E, and F or something. But, uh, talking about something. Uh, well, actually, we're not talking about B1 or B2. What we're trying to do is there's, as you know, there's three basic configurations. There's Central Hill, North Hill, for lack of a better way of saying it, Central Hill, North Hill, and downtown. So we're trying to either eliminate one of the three or <laughs> somehow or other find our way to one. And that's where the conversation sort of is. Um, Ward eight, whatever it turns out to be, should be composed, but feels more like a neighborhood, not a leftover. And that means some people can't be in the ward they used to be, particularly because ward one, you know, growing. Anyone else? This in terms of central central hill. Gary, if you have anything, if you have anything to say, you know, just sort of just speak up. We're all sort of doing that. And I'm I'm happy to switch this and show any other maps if. Feel free to call it out if you ever need them changed. Is it is it fair to say that is there anyone um, is there anyone and I, I appreciate the fact that I'm not really sure exactly what happened. You know, Soraya sent me an email and said that it's told us about a week and a half ago that she would be available from five to six ten. So that's why we're having the work session now. Not really sure quite what happened. There must have been a change, and I feel badly that we have someone who's not here who represents Ward One. Um, my understanding from what Soraya said at the last council meeting was that the, so to speak, I don't, I don't know how they became known as the North Hill, but whatever for what, however that happened, it became the North Hill. That they were okay with any ward being in a ward, provided that they were in the same ward. And that was like what I thought 
because there was at one point there was a difference and i think those a lot of these were attempted to make sure that the north hill section was together even if they were in the new ward eight um, like that one uh, so i don't know if that has changed i don't you know i haven't had a chance to talk with soraya since that time um you know other than Jean, is there anyone who feels strongly in keeping the Central Hill version one or version two? We're just talking about it overall. Joe? Yeah, I would like to at least keep it under consideration given the way it addresses the issues we're talking about. Okay. Um, all right, well, let's move on to the other two. There's only one map that you have, um, Nancy, for uh, downtown. So maybe that would be an, that might be a might be an easier one to sort of think about whether or not that one is is one to move forward with. Um, how do people feel about this map? I really like this map, except for the the North Hill problem, if you want to call it that. Um, it 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 does sort of address uh, one of the objectives that we had heard uh, through some of the public comment in uh, in the uh, in the ad hoc and, and and afterwards as we talked about re redistricting around establishing a downtown board and this map does that. Um, it also, although it doesn't come within um, fifty percent for each of the. Uh, any one ward having no more than fifty percent of the um, on-campus students, it, it comes it comes pretty darn close. I mean, but except for like Ward One ends up with with fifty-seven. So I, I I like this concept. The one thing that, I, that you know, and I would like I said, I would defer to others. Just like I don't want people, you know, telling Sarah and I and Ali how the new north end should be divided up. I I sort of defer to others on. You know these these neighborhood boundaries um, around Ward One and, and Ward Two, and, and not knowing as much as the councilors who represent those districts, I can't really say whether or not this would be an objection of other or, or from Councilor Bergman who said that this wouldn't be good. So, but besides that, I like everything else about it. But we just began to spend one of these things where when we fix one thing, we create problems elsewhere. And this is this is the. The, um, or that we create features elsewhere that may or may not be problems. And then this is one of the features we created with the downtown. But I do like it. Uh, under, understanding others may have different views. Well, let me just say this moves Ward 2. Look at where it moves it all the way up to. It moves up to Trinity Campus. And, and fundamentally, take it, 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 it joins uh, the, the IAA um, neighborhood, my neighborhood, Roosevelt Park, is very different than the Upper Hill District and predominates actually from uh, I, this is of all of them the least acceptable. Joe, how do you feel about it? Uh, it's not my favorite. Uh, it has uh, it does feel like it's it's reaching a little bit to create shapes that I don't feel like it's moving out to me. Is there anyone who really likes this map? I think it'd be fair to say, from my perspective, that we could take this one out of consideration. To me, it seems like the debate has been over the North Hill versus the Central. I agree with Mark. I mean, I think that this addresses many of the concerns that um, folks have raised, but uh, I, I do think sort of the fundamental changes here, particularly to War Two and, and to Ward One, as Gene outlined here, are, are enough to me to say this one should be taken out of consideration. 
Yeah, I would tend to agree with that. I think that uh, I think this sort of um, we we went to an eight ward configuration to try to maintain a certain level of character in the old north end, and this sort of goes in the in a different direction. So. Um, uh, I mean, I would be fine with that. Is there anyone who wouldn't be fine with that as Ben is suggesting to eliminate this map or this approach, this downtown? Yeah, it's called, is that what it's called, downtown? Yeah. I'm not hearing anybody jumping up and down that they have to have it. So why don't we, why don't we continue on with the North Hill and just focus our efforts on the North Hill versus the Central Hill? Um, so maybe you could just explain once more what the, there's, there's three versions of this and what these versions do in terms of um, their main characteristics, Nancy or Megan. Sure. Um, oh, so um, as I said, Northville version one and Northville version two are very similar besides a few blocks. Um, so both of these make a ward eight out of the sort of Henry Loomis neighborhood plus the Beale Street neighborhood, I would say are the primary ones. Um, and then uh, the other map, which I think I, I'm trying to call the ward eight with UVM main campus, um, this just, this map shifts that neighborhood a bit so that it can include um, the central campus of UVM. Um, and shifts some blocks around in there and also moves the Buell Street neighborhood to Ward 3. Um, do these, could you talk about how um, version one and two are different in terms of the athletic campus, Nancy? Sure. Yeah, so they, they actually they do have a slightly different configuration of the athletic campus. One takes, one um, has work, I would need to double check. Um, uh, they take a slightly different combination of dorms. Um, so in version one, Ward one has uh, University Heights instead of Paris Millis. And in version two, it gets the reverse. So it gets Paris Millis, but not University difference between those two configurations is about 200 students. Um, so it's not, a, it's not a huge difference. Um, it does change the percent on campus uh, for Ward 1, but only slightly, only by 2%. So it's right around 50% for both versions on Ward 1. And then it's a bit higher for Ward 6 for both of these versions because Ward 6, um, gets that one extra dorm in the athletic campus. And then it's also gets the Champlain College area for the most and, part. And Redstone. And Redstone, yes. I will um, I'll just say I've had outreach for a number of Ward 8, current Ward 8 residents, um, kind of taking me up on the point that uh, they have no current council representation um, wanting to make sure uh, I made it clear that um, uh, from their perspective, this, uh, the North Hill maps are, uh, are uh, maps that they strongly prefer. And, um, uh, and so that's the, the clear input from that group that has had, uh, you know, been put in this challenging position for the last, most of the last decade. And I guess I would further share with my Overall, mayoral hat, um, you know, there are many maps that I would be fine with. Uh, I, I find this, I find this pretty compelling um, coherent map that uh, makes a lot of sense to me. Uh, there are others that I accept as well, but you know, it's really the North Hill maps uh, from, from some perspective. That said, I, there, I do see that there's significant changes to the old North End, which is the year of the old North End. One of the technical little tweaks, if you look at this map, well, both of these maps go into the uh, word one uh, north of uh, 
Willard Street, but I just wonder if there's anybody who is living and, and any of the of those like one, two, three portions by Hyatt Street. You've got a cemetery there. Yeah, up there, yeah, right on the there you go. You got a large cemetery. I I, I hate to, to it would it would make me feel better, although I don't believe anybody is living there. Uh, it's to, it's to, to, not the cemetery. <laughs> to put the cemetery back in the ward one. And I actually don't believe that uh, across the street, now that there's like those buildings are showing or Charlotte's, that whole area, there's one person who lives on Intervale, or one house, I don't know how many people are in the house, I don't think there are more than two. And they are in ward one. So that whole, uh, can you show us where you're talking uh, about? Of course, that'd be great. Right. Yeah, I was thinking you're talking about right here, right? That's where I'm talking about. Yeah. Look at that. It says St. Joseph Cemetery. This entire area here. This is Charlotte Boys. This is Queen City Metal. That's a, my friend Christy Delphia's house that's still in here. So is she in two? She is in two, and she will continue to be in two. Uh, if you just sort of draw that, if you just sort of keep that, I, I don't think it makes a difference. I probably should go in to Ward 8, keep the lines running. So you're saying like east of Willard Street? Look at the cemetery. Yep. There is nobody living there. East of Hyde. So you're just saying it should go up. It should go up. It should, it should, it should, ward, should, ward 8 should go up. And yeah. just be that that whole thing should be continuous. Yeah, and where that little you? thing, that corner, that sliver there, what is there that, on the other side? What is that little sliver right there? Uh, would be Hyde Street. Uh, the, uh, so there is on the other side, Hyde goes into Willard. I right oh, there, right. and uh, so I am not suggesting, and, th and those are in Ward 2 right now. Gene, why do you want this? Why do I, I don't want that. I think oh, just- think, Why do you want it to change? I want it changed because it bleeds into the existing Ward 1, and it, it sort of, it makes no sense for it to go into Ward 2. You want it in the, and that's Ward 8 that's underneath there? If you're gonna, if you're gonna create, uh, a new ward in that section, it would seem best that it continues on there. It's okay. sort of like when you when we look at maps of redistricting and we have the intervale in ward two. I don't understand why, but kind of a, you know it, it, it lends to a way of thinking which is distorted because it makes it seem like you got this huge area, but there ain't not a single person living there. You you think it just looks bad? I do. I think it. It makes me start to think about um, this being more of a um, a moving of or two away from the uh, the boundaries that I've known for the last uh, fifty years, forty years, forty years. So, okay. I don't really have a strong feeling about that. I do. I could get stronger if you'd like, but nobody wants to hear that. <laughs> it seems fine if you want to, if you want that. I agree with you. Could, could I just ask, ask a point of clarification? When you said move it into the this Ward 8, do you mean just the cemetery, Councillor Bergman? Like up there. Yeah, I think that, I mean, it should be. Sure, if there is going to be housing development in, in the Charlotte Boys, Queen City, after we spend a $17,000 million on the brownfields for mediation, um, there will be a lot of other changes in the city and population-wide that we will have uh, to address anyway. I can cross that bridge. Yeah. Well, when you say that, I think we're all confused. Do you want that in? or No, I want Charlotte Boys out. You want that in? Is that to stay in Ward 2? So this right here, going from I, I all have, this. I'd have that stay all in Ward 8 or right here. I think it makes well, the most. There's 17 and 14 people. Is that right? But not the 17. Not so the not 17. the 17, the 14. 
So and this right here. How are those people living? There's nobody there. Well, 14 are living there. So right no, here. There's no house there. That I mean. Is that down? Is that heading down towards the interval? Yes. Oh, okay. If, 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 what, oh, if, 14, is it 14 because of the businesses there? <laughs> so uh, what, what people live there? <laughs> <laughs> so that's Queen City. Who's living there? <laughs> I don't know. You got the health center, people. and you got you got a housing project, right? You got a house. You got apartments right next to the health center. Right. That's where fourteen people live. Yeah. There's two houses there, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, there's a park. You go down the hill. It's right there. Shared driveway. Um, I, I'll, I'll just add that looking at the house districts, those two maps are in a separate house, or those two blocks are in a separate house district from the address to warn to, and so I think it would make sense for that reason alone to. Should just go ahead. Would that mean that when the would that mean that when the polling places that was one thing that we heard was polling places we felt like they had too many tabulators. It would line up better. Okay. Yeah, right. we'll eliminate the tabulator. That would be even better. Yeah. Okay. We should check the numbers. So the other point of clarification I would say is that the, the census did just year add some amount of random noise to the blocks, and so they are not exact counts. And so they, there may be blocks that are off that we know are off. Right, but and they, they did that to protect anonymity because when we're talking about this small of a geographic area, um, it was important for their purposes to make sure that that people's identities could be protected. But I I, I don't believe there is a homeless encampment with 14 <laughs> people there. I mean, they're, they're, perhaps down dead man's there could be. I mean, so, do I need a Is the only or? concern about this, uh, <laughs> this uh, map, or is this otherwise? Uh, we have where? I mean, I, I mean that the problem that I that we have is with Ward One. Uh, we was not here. I mean, I don't have a problem other than that from uh, the. Uh, the old North End standpoint, if my two old North End colleagues are, are okay with the other and this, is, and this is the North Hill version one, mm -hmm. right? I think it applies to both version one and version two. Okay. Yeah, this change I think would be identical. So this layers all three of the kind of takes on North Hill, uh, version one, version two, and then the one that says UVM Maine and some Champlain. Mm -hmm. um, you can see that the boundaries of Ward 2, 8, and 1 in that area we were just talking about are identical. So that change can be made in any of these versions. And and this the only issue that anyone had with this was Jean wanted the Ward 8 to extend up past the cemetery. And did was that also to include those that those 14 people? Was that the only request so far? So far, very good. So far. Does that include the and so Jean that did include those the, those fourteen people or no? It could. It could. Okay, it not just the cemetery. Change. Not just the cemetery and not the seventeen people on the left there, but the just the fourteen that right that grouping up there. Okay, just trying to follow. Somebody who doesn't argue for a strict adherence to the absolute ten percent deviation, I'm okay with losing those fourteen votes. Okay. So I think for me, um, well, I, I do support the North Hill approach um, as someone who is directly impacted by the uh, on-campus population. Um, I, I can't support a map that um, gives any more, more than 50% of an on-campus population. I, I, don't, I don't think it's, it's fair. Um, I just don't think it's fair. Um, I don't. I don't support the Central Hill, but I think that um, there the other map, at least from what I saw, the population totals is um, puts fifty percent of the students um, that are on campus, and that's those are the those are the students that are you know, are by, by definition inaccessible to anyone other than a student. And even then, I'm not even sure how accessible they are if you 
or a student who lives on one part of a campus, you're not really, it's not, it's maybe easier to, to have that level of accessibility, but certainly is not a, a given. Um, ward one in this would be 50%, ward six would be 48 or 49%, and ward eight would be 20% which still is a far cry from the 75 or 70% 70 that Ward 8 is today. Um, and what I heard from in some of the emails that we got was that uh, one resident pointed to the neighborhood project, um, which was done a number of years ago. And in, that, in, that, in there, there was a map that showed concentrations of students that live off campus. And the greatest, the greatest amount is a certain, like about a, a block, not a block, but a number of blocks that are in what would be in that map, part of Ward 3 and part of Ward 8, but not all of either. Um, ward 3, the people that were that are currently in Ward 8, that would then in this map be in Ward 3, would be in a, would go from being in a, in a ward that is 75% on campus to about 5%. Um, and would be in, you know, to some degree a downtown area, which I thought initially that was what people really wanted. They wanted to be in a downtown area. They felt that their Priorities were similar to many of the people that are downtown. Um, and I think that we, I think we have to acknowledge that, um, you know, if you live near the UVM campus, just many, many advantages, you are going to live by definition amongst many students. That's just the way it is. And I, I, I don't really focus as much on the, the students that rent in neighborhoods. Um, I'm more focused on the number of students that are inaccessible as voters to anyone who you know, wants to run for school board or wants to run for really anything. Um, and to make it so that we are sharing in that responsibility. Um, we all love having UVM here, and I think it's only fair that we should share in some of the challenges of having many students in our midst. And I think this map does that. Could, could we zoom in? I'd like to know those two little salience. There's one that, uh, that's different in this map than, than is in um, North Hill version one and version two. There's that little thing that sticks out to the west there. What street is the Between west? College and Maine. Okay. Yeah. In the south, it looks like the cross is Main Street. Is that that's you? Is that you in the street or where it's right above Edmonds Middle School? Okay. Which, um, you know, until we have, I don't know that there's that many people who live around Edmonds Middle School. It's probably a pretty small number, but until we have the sighting only place is not having to be in the board. Um, there's only two places, I think, places in some of these other wards. Ward one is challenged finding a polling place, uh, and ward two is challenged finding a polling place, which just aren't that many places. There's really only two in ward six, and ward one, I mean, there's probably, I don't know, a hospital. Uh, there aren't that many places, or all of UVM. Which I'd say they'd have a lot. We, we, we thought about that. I remember when Ward 8, we were trying to find some place for Ward 8 after a memorial and ended up going to the Metro Library. It's, it's a challenge in some words. And uh, I don't know if, Nancy, you want to speak to kind of why this looks the way it does. Ultimately, is about making sure that Ward 8 at least meets a, a minimum population that would be needed to make this overall plan work. Yeah, so, so, and on this map, um, that block next to Edmonds is split. So um, if you zoom in there, um, 
that block is a fairly large block. There's 88 um, residents on the Edmond side and then 346 on the sort of Champlain side. It's already split in two. And so this map splits the Champlain side. So it just includes one door and moves that into Ward 8. Um, and then the block above it is a, it's a fairly large um, block. It's like 250 people. Um, so that so that was needed to make Ward 8 big enough because it was losing that Ewell Street neighborhood. Um, and then the dorms were moved so that uh, the, all the, each ward would have less than 50% student population. Okay. Uh, it's a new one. North Hill. Um, it's North actually like, it's Ward 8. Okay. It's a version of North Hill, but it's called UVM Main Campus and some Champlain. Thank you. The population, the on-campus population numbers for this map, they were were they added to the um or they in yes, there's memo? a new document. second memo. It's uh, like map population is no longer top. Map updated. Population's updated yeah. Yeah. This one seems a fair, including the young. What is the what is the on campus population right now of North Hill? Um, I would have to do that. I don't think it's particularly high because more and more currently doesn't move in the athletic complex. Right. Okay. So if it and, and how many are on athletic? Uh, two thousand three hundred. Um. Okay. This is terrible for Ward One. I have to say, I, I, you define terrible. I mean, it it it, it guts its historic uh, board all the way from Willard uh, East. The entire freaking thing. But they just gained 360 people in a new neighborhood. And that's the problem. They, right? I understand their problems. So so, I'm just saying is that uh, I don't think that this is the solution. Um, looking at these other maps, maybe there are some ways to uh, to tweak in the North Hills. One. Uh, I think you've got to make or it came together as a neighborhood, not be. <laughs> well, your North Hill versions one and two do that. So, you know, whether perhaps tweaks can be made. Um, but two wards are way over 50%. Version two. It looks like there's 45, 47. Oh, it's um, in the North Hill versions, um, Ward 1 is right at 50% and Ward 6 is at like 60%. I mean, for students, the, the best one is uh, the Ward 8 uh, uh, version, Central Hill version 2 and 1. Which map did you miss that you gave your name? I hated that one, uh, this uh, new one. I down there. It's got a long name. Ah, oh, there it is. It's the word eight with UVM main campus and sub Champlain. <clears throat> Yeah. 
Anyone else have any uh, opinions about the North Hill? Not particularly version one, version two, or version three, or just in general. Uh, you know, if we could if we could possibly get ourselves it appears as though we've eliminated the downtown, the one downtown map. That puts us into either Central Hill or North Hill. Are there are others who have an opinion about North Hill. Maybe we can arrive at some sort of consensus, Ben. Well, so I I've liked a lot of maps before we've gotten to this point here. Um, and, um, you know, with the versions that we have still in front of us, personally, I've always liked a map closer to uh, one, of the, one of the Central Hill maps more. You know, and I've said that in the working group as well. And, you know, I think that there's a way to make the Central Hill maps look a little less salamandery. You know, like if you were to, Nancy, if you went to version one instead of version two here, you know, I think that there's a way that you could um, give the entire athletic campus to Ward 8, the living and learning community, which is in Ward 1 right now, is 514 students. So you could put that into Ward 8 and extend the Ward 8 boundary all the way over to uh, East Avenue, it would grab some of the um, houses that are on the west side of East Avenue, but I don't think there's that many residential properties on the west side of, of East Avenue. So you can sort of envision here that it would look less like a sort of little <coughs> boot hanging down there and, uh, you know, more, more truly uh, a board yes, age that would extend all the way over to East Avenue. And what you would have to do is you would have to swap um, some of the western northern boundaries of Ward 8 there to get even out the 514 that are coming out of the living and learning community. So uh, that to me is a map that I've always been interested in, but um, what I've sort of said all along, right, is that the direction that we head in, whether it be North Hill or Central Hill, is really a question over the extent to which we are willing to continue to perpetuate the issue that we've identified as being um, the Ward 8 issue. So, you know, when you look at, uh, even if you can make it look a little less salamandry, including by Redstone going into Ward 6, and, um, some of the central campus going somewhere, you know, whatever it may be, um, there's, there's still going to be an issue that we've heard from a number of uh, Ward 8 Sort of non-student, non-on-campus student residents um, who are concerned about that issue. So, you know, I, I don't think there's any way we can proceed with a Central Hill map that doesn't in some way perpetuate the issue that we identified as being one of the things that we wanted to fix when we started this process. It fixes it somewhat, you know, it goes from more than 70% on-campus students to closer to 50% on-campus students, but it, it still is an issue. If that is the issue, if still sort of fixing that issue is still our top priority, then I do think we need to uh, uh, focus on the North Hill maps um, and, and any one of the versions that are out there. Because as Sarah has pointed out, appropriately so, right? I mean, that, that's really the only other way we do this, right? I mean, either we either we keep all these on-campus students in Ward 8 and try to trim it to the greatest extent we can, extent we can or, or we don't. And if we don't do it, then we have to create another neighborhood. And to me, in all the maps we've looked at, the North Hill maps are the ones that make the most sense to me. So that, that to me is the question for us to deal with here is, is to what extent is our comfort level with continuing to perpetuate the, the, the sort of boarding issue that we identified after day one? Well, certainly what we hear from Ward 8 residents is pretty clear. Um, they don't want us to perpetuate that. That's what we hear from them. I think, you know, in fairness to the fact that they have, you know, no representation um, right now, that, you know, this, this map is not, it, is perpetuating what they would prefer if they were represented. And I think if there was someone or two 
counselors here would say that they hear loud and clear from Ward 8 residents that this approach is not something they would like to see continue. I mean, to me, the only thing that I think is, there's only one positive, I think, to this kind of a map, and it's not about the map, it's about the percentages. And that is that um, the reason that we're in the predicament that we're in um, is because Ward 1 has grown and we need to accommodate some of the people that live in Ward 1 into other wards. That's just the way it is. There's like no real way around that. Um, you know, there is a lot of precedence um, beginning with probably 1993 that the athletic campus was part of Warren One. It is only in the last eight years that the athletic campus has not been in Warren One. Um, similarly, on um, the Redstone campus, it's always been in Ward 6 until eight years ago when it no longer was. When we went from seven wards to eight wards. So, I mean, personally, as someone who lives there, I think that the Redstone campus should be part of Ward 6. And that's just simply a matter of geography. Um, clearly, Ward 6 cannot have the athletic campus and the Redstone campus, or it would have no one else. If you extend on this metric, Ward 8 up to North Street, that quadrant there, how many people are there? Uh, so it looks like. Um, you mean this, this section? Yes. Um, maybe 400, a little more than 400. So that takes uh, us down to 350. Yes, and yep. then War 2 would definitely have to make that up. I guess with the case of this particular map, I think that is right. We need to have either a consensus, yes or no, if we, these maps do to some degree perpetuate there were, I think, three things that we wanted to do. One was to keep the old North End separate from the new North End. We wanted to make, at the time when we were thinking about more counselors or a different configuration, to have two counselors that resided in each ward. And the other was to eliminate the eliminate what we know of today as Ward 8. Um, and it would seem as though Well, it does reduce the number. Uh, I don't remember now. What? How many are in Ward Eight in under the Central Hill? How many? What was the percentage? I can't remember now. Central Hill. How many hundred? Um, it would be in Ward Eight. It would be almost 50, 46 percent. Um, so it's less than. It's less than 75. Is this two or one? This is number one. This is number two. How many people are supportive of a central hill map? 
can tweak it. I would. And how would and what, how would you want it? I'm not sure. I need to oh. now see the see sort of the numbers to to try to give them more. Um, more non student housing there. But you mean more aid? Be more aid, yeah. Uh -huh. And and maybe and, and sort of doing what Ben had suggested in terms of the, the contiguousness by going up to this down. So it would be on that side? It's so be on, yes, it would be on the east side. It'd be on the west side of East Avenue, which there are some um, some houses, not a lot. But John, I, yeah, I I can't support the um, central maps. That, I mean, I I'm willing to support a variety of different maps, but to me, I can't support the central maps. And it's honestly not just because the people living in the current Ward Eight don't like it. It's because I don't think it's fair. Um, you know, I think that that's. Uh, that remains, uh, it really remains a gerrymandered student board. Um, and you have very few people um, electing the same number of city councilors that other wards elect with a whole lot more people. And then that, you know, the number of voters, as we're dividing districts, uh, while legally the only thing that matters is the census numbers, as a matter of fairness, I think that the number of voters in a district actually matters as well. Um, so I I can't support central district defense. I, I don't particularly like if it's a choice between the, the central and the north now. I like the north now is better to have more of a sense of place to them than central home maps sort of sort of meander sort of diagonally through town and up a bunch of sort of identities along the way. Um, so of, of the options if we're talking between um, central and north hill maps I like the north hill concept better. I like the ones that are more rectangular than the last one but I understand also that we're trying to um, Portion students, so you know, we, we, you know, with that comes some sort of you know contortion of the shape. But um, I like the normal ones better. It's, it's, it's concept. So personally, after thinking about it further, after hearing from really all the residents in Ward Eight, including election officials who've really been living the difficulty of trying to run elections in the existing board day. Uh, I am inclined to support one of the North Hill maps as well. I, I think I need to express some level of discomfort though in taking a final approach to that though, because the two wards that are most heavily impacted by that are wards one and wards eight. And as a group right now discussing this, we have zero representation in either one of those wards because two of the representatives have resigned and, and one of them, unfortunately, is unable, unable to be here right now. So I don't know what that means with respect to our timeline, but I think it's important to express some level of discomfort in taking final action when we haven't heard from the representatives from those, uh, from those wards. Maybe. Again, I'm elected official representative of those wards. They have reached out to me. The active residents and, and the wards have been pretty clear. They prefer the, with respect to Ward 8, at least the, uh, the North Hill map. You know, I, I think the fact that we are having these conversations uh, down counselors in this part of town is part of function of the challenge we're trying to address here. And I think we should. Not, uh, I'm not sure what you're suggesting, Councilor Travers, that you don't think we should. Uh, I don't think we should delay uh, action for there to be representation again. Yeah. 
to get to, to wait for a board eight duly elected councilor, we'd be waiting for a whole nother election cycle. Yeah, and, and I'm not suggesting that. Uh, I guess what I'm suggesting is, I mean, been on the working group here, you know, I mean, I found that each time we sort of focused in at a particular map, you know, we, we didn't suddenly hear from the folks who are most directly impacted by it, right? So I think that we've heard from a number of the folks who are, who've been upset, have been sort of living toward an issue for some time because they've seen a number of maps that have been posted that would, as I put it, continue to perpetuate that issue. I, I don't know, you know, I mean, I think we heard a little bit from Councillor Hightower with respect to the maps that would cut out the North Hill section. From my perspective, I, I agree with you, Mara, that, um, you know, I think those maps make sense. We haven't talked about it much, but because we decided to focus on an eight ward four district map, I think that one of the ways to address some of the concerns would be to ensure that we continue to have an East district that is wards one and wards eight, such that the North Hill would be, uh, as Council Burton has pointed out, sort of the historic um, uh, neighborhood support one ward eight would still be represented by an East district counselor. That doesn't currently represent that neighborhood with the existing wards one and wards eight. Um, so I, obviously we can't wait for the special election, or uh, certainly not until next town meeting day, and we'll fill the one eight seat. Um, but I am anticipating that we're going to hear from some folks in the North Hill area, in particular, uh, if we were to finalize and settle on that map. Are there tweaks that can be made in this North Hill? Um, <coughs> I mean, I see the deviation right now in uh, version one is they have a population of 76 over, um, but I mean, so that means there, there's some space to go up. Um, and uh, <coughs> more eight has got a little space to go down. Is there some, some tweaking perhaps in the, uh, the Northeast part? Of uh, what is now what would be depicted as North as Fort Eight, uh, there to bring some of those people back into Ward One. I, I don't know what the numbers are. I mean, the actual I, blocks. Um, so from what I understand, uh, I think there's some older um, eight ward maps where the line was drawn along North Prospect Street. But it was my understanding that that was considered dividing that neighborhood and that those maps were not um, favored. Given the developments that I'm hearing here, yeah. it may be that it would be more favored than than this one too, in that regard. So I, I mean, I, I, I just say that, you know, at this point, if, you know, I this works okay for the old north end in my mind as war two in particular. So you know, I I, I get uh, enough comments from ward one people to uh, to feel some obligation to see about uh, making some adjustments or to, to see if there are adjustments that can be made um, within this framework that it would sound like that people have got. Um, so there. My comment again is, you know, we're talking about people being, more they being represented, we're creating a new neighborhood. And so that's, that's just awkward because you can't feel like you represent a neighborhood brand new. And I think Ben's point about, does this hang together as the East District? Does that work? Because they will have representation. By an East District Councilor <laughs> with a more. But you got that curb out there on North Prospect Street, right there. What is that? You see the indentation yeah. there. I mean, that that, that that's yeah. not inconsistent with what you're saying. If that if, if the numbers again, and this is yeah. all questions of of numbers, so where you've got that little indentation in Ward 8 going into Ward 1. In fact, if the numbers can be made to bring more of those people back into Ward 1, I don't know what they're, and I'm not representing them. Well, uh, the but, problem you've got, you've got a chunk of people at Macaulay Square that up. Uh, yeah, yeah. We have little 
little bumps. That's a pretty big one. I'm just asking so, to, to maybe crunch some numbers there. Yeah, yeah so in that, those three blocks, there's around 230 people. Um, and so that would mean shifting, again, shifting another boundary. And I think the challenge would be um, what Ward 1 would lose, um, maybe a dorm. Um, but because there's not other ways to shift that boundary. Mm -hmm. um, and then Ward 8 would have to be somewhere. Where they got those uh, the high street try it's not there next yeah the high street check that that was like two hundred or seventy two people um so it might start to balance that out but I'm just that we have to act yeah so <coughs> unfortunately I think that we do need to be salary we're going on the edges here to, to see if we can come up with some accommodation so is there um, that, that's what i'm suggesting yeah that we that we do here and here the votes are lining up to a north district uh, a north hill. a north hill i'm sorry then um yeah is everyone okay with moving forward with north hill and we'll just try to figure out from there where we go um we have three so versions of a real objection to that. We have three versions of the North Hill. We right now we have three versions of it. I mean the the the, the difference mostly is um you know the you know the shared responsibility for the on campus and inaccessible student population um and um, how to uh, address that in a fair and equitable way. That's really the, I think that's really the crux of that. And also whether, you know, none of these North Hill maps keeps the North Hill in board one as right now, as of right now, that's sort of why they're called the North, I guess it's board eight to North Hill. That's why they're called that. Um, the question is, I mean, my understanding and I, maybe I'm wrong is that, uh, you know, it's rise not here is that the impression I got was that when she went to the MPA that Keeping that neighborhood intact was the priority. If we went with eight wards, if we went with seven wards, then clearly that neighborhood would stay in Ward One. But if it doesn't, if we go to eight wards, which we all agreed on with, some I mean something has to give in the Ward One map. They how many how many have they? Is it nine hundred that they pay or? Trying to remember now. Uh, I, 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 yeah. yeah. So you know something somewhere that has to be accommodated. Um, and there really is, especially if we're going to address the student, the student on campus population. Go ahead, Ben, and then we'll try to see if we can maybe figure out a path forward. <laughs> I would be prepared to. Start to work around the edges with respect to the North Hill map. I, do, I just think, again, it's important for us to sort of go back to some of the other concerns that have been stated here, though, which is that I'm mindful of the fact that in Ward 6 right now, the on campus student population is 14%. That's what it is right now in Ward 6. With North Hill version 1 and North Hill version 2, both those maps move the on campus student population in Ward 6 to 61% and 59% respectively. That, that's a huge change uh, for Ward 6 in the dynamic of, of, of who is in that ward, right? And, and whereas some of these Central Hill maps, you know, do again, I think, perpetuate another issue, at least the changes to on-campus student populations are a little bit less sort of shocking to the system, so to speak. Um, than, than some of the North Hill maps. So, you know, I would be prepared to proceed with a North Hill map, but I, I do want to say that I think versions one and two that are that are up there, and Councilor Paul, I don't know if you have any thoughts on this, but you represent Ward 6, or Councilor Shannon as well, you represent Ward 6, um, too. Um, but, you know, I, I'm still a little bit concerned about the huge shift in on-campus student population in Ward 6 and North Hill versions. 
one and two. And I'm wondering if there's any <coughs> around the edges there that could work. I think we have a version that somewhat does that in the in the last version in there, four eight main some champlain. Um, but I, I don't know if any of the Ward Six representatives, because we're in a working session, Council Paul, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that as well. Uh, well, I mean, I think the, I mean, for me, the, you know, we, we used to have a chief administrative officer who was very big on things being fair, factual, and forward. And I think this, given the fact that, you know, there are, there are going to be changes in population all over the city, I think this is a little bit more forward. Um, and, and I think it's more fair. You know, I think the, the, the challenge that any board is going to have when they get to the point where they're 61, 62% on campus is a challenge. You know, you, once you go over 50%, um, I think there are challenges with, um, uh, with polling places and um, just engagement in that way. And, and the ability to be able to reach out to constituents who are, um, I think we've all agreed, are inaccessible to anyone other than a student. So I think that is a challenge that, um, and a responsibility that we have that should be shared. Um, I think that, um, I think that there needs to be consideration for off-campus student housing as well as on-campus student student housing. It's true that the dorms are locked, as are many um, condo apartment complexes across the city, and I represent several of them now. Uh, seems like there should be we there should we should provide access. Actually, we should be provided access, um, but. So for me, I wouldn't, I, the, the third map I really haven't had enough chance to study and I think they all have some potential and I guess I don't have a strong opinion right now. I, I wouldn't want to rule any of them out without having compared them a little bit better. Is there anyone who would be opposed to narrowing this down to the North Hill maps and figuring out a path forward will hopefully have Soraya back as the other counselor who represents the other side of the equation or one uh, and that we move forward with finding a finding a solution using the North Hill maps. Is there anyone who has we say North Hill groups were including the UBM, the one labeled UBM main campus and some Champlain. That is yeah, that those are North those North are North all North. yeah, those are all there's North Hill. I don't I don't I'm sorry, I don't know what they're called. Um, I haven't really studied that part of it, but yes, there would be three <laughs> maps that are effectively moving to North Hill. Um not even sure where that term came from, but um in the interest of simplicity, um, is there anyone who has who is opposed to moving in that direction? As the one person who has expressed some yes. opposition, I will not block that forward. I would like to see a board one folks get a shot at uh, at weighing in. I'd like to see some tweaking around the edges, so to speak, to see if we can do that as well as possible. But, I would like us to meet the uh, December 12th. So what that would do is that, um, and we also have another deadline, which is that we're counting the days down to when we are going to be losing our mapping specialist. Uh, for those of you watching, watching who writes online. The meets and bounds? What's that? Who, write, who writes the meets and bounds? That was written by Jay Appleton in the planning office the last night. Then we were on the legal aspects of the charter investigation. There needs to be yeah. um, thought to that because it's not really necessary or appropriate for the charter change committee to get thrown in between 
doesn't add anything. We need to see the numbers. Right. Uh, right. Uh, so uh, we have a meeting on the 21st. Um, uh, so what I'm what I'm <laughs> sort of hearing is that uh, first we need to hear from Soraya. Secondly, um, if there is a way to address some of the challenges that are in any of these three versions of the map, we come up with perhaps another approach. Um, I don't know. It seems like we sort of run around and around over these, but perhaps there are some other ways that we could approach. Um, are there, just for the benefit, for Nancy's benefit, um, for anyone, particularly those who are to some degree impacted by this, what would be the priorities when you say like tweaking? What would be, if just to be able to give Nancy some direction, what are the concerns that you would most like to see if we can address? <clears throat> I, I believe that neighborhoods in uh, sort of the area around what well, Prospect Street and um, North or South? North, uh, north across. Okay. Street. So, right there. That area, yeah. You know, um, again, what I, I think you're looking to do is the, the most um, gain on uh, these traditional neighborhoods, neighbors that are traditional in the, in the sport, and that provide the, the balance of safety. We don't want to replicate in Ward One the problems in the league. <laughs> So, I mean, that doesn't do us any good. It just is that bubble. Um, so, All right, well, you know, that's, that's my thought. And to the extent, the, the, yeah, to which Ben's ideas in terms of moving the East Avenue makes sense. And that would be moving the East Avenue to Ford 8. Uh, <clears throat> I think so. Yes, and then moving some into Ward Six, I think, is what uh, doesn't work on this map. No, not not on this map, it. but I mean, this is just one of the uh, maps. I don't think that we settled on a single, not the Virgil version. No, so not the no, you're right. It doesn't work on this map, but the other ones. It, it, that plan would only work on the Central Hill maps because um, otherwise, Ward Eight would get in between two parts of Ward. Okay, so. Um, all right, well, we'll we'll try to see if there are other iterations that we could possibly come up with for the North Hill approach. Um, maybe, you know, maybe doing something with Central Campus that's even, you know, we've talked about splitting um, athletic, although this doesn't, but we've talked about that in the past. Maybe there are other things that we can do. Um, and that would be for for the 21st. Um, just so everyone knows, uh, Lori did find me the 2013 resolution for redistricting. Not easy to find, they're all in boxes, but she did find it. And uh, it's a fairly simple resolution. So um, in the interest of being able to move this to the 12th, we really need to come up with a AMAP by the 21st. And hopefully we can all be here so that we can have as full a representation as we can to be able to bring this to a close. Now we can move on to something else more exciting for the day. Um, it's uh, 6.38, we'll go upstairs um, and uh, um, reconvene upstairs. And please take a cookie if there are still some left. <laughs> So I bring them upstairs. <clears throat> We did pretty well. Yeah. Yeah.
I promise. No, I was uh, over caffeinated and moving fast this morning. What's that? Hey, I don't. I don't know if you want to turn off the audio on that screen in that room. Didn't realize that there were these just somewhere. I think we need a little, you know, who is it, like the parents from the community bank? Oh, right, yep. But get somebody who would go to financing, because it's kind of ridiculous that they're going to this market. That they will cost finance a ton of money. And they will cost finance much when you will come up. I mean, I need to tune myself up on the, I mean, the secondary market doesn't want that's what the impediment is, and I don't know where they're going to get their money from, but, you know, if they're able to hang it on to it during construction, at least the construction period, that's where you can't get construction done. Um, all right, we're sort of behind, so. In terms of lender risk, we'll have to wait until the mayor comes up to find I don't in this market. I mean, this is a hangover from 2008 and 10 when... All these lenders were left with half-built condominiums, but that's a decade ago. That's not going to happen to them. If they want to rent them, they can afford to rent them. Like, if they can't sell them, mm -hmm. and the financiers think there's a market for the rental, but not for the sale, they can rent them. You run into some problems. i got to think this one out. We should get tuned up because... Favorite owner, obviously, and 
Yes. Yes. I don't have that phone anymore. Really? So you can, although I hate to say anything yeah. about financing because yeah. I find that it changes every day. Yes. Whatever I say afterwards yesterday. Yeah. yeah. But the last I knew, I was surprised to find out that that had been eliminated. It's no longer a thing. See, I thought it was, but I, that, I'm three years out of the gate here, so I don't have a really <laughs> focus other than... It was for a long time. Oh, yeah. And everybody had to put cash on, but... Yeah. Not anymore. Well, I know VHFA is going to wanting to do more work on this, because they've got some money, actually, for this missile... Mi Middle missing housing, missing middle housing. Um, they're more focused probably on single family development, but as I said in Burlington, that's to get home ownership, it's got to be condo. This is not going to be freestanding single family. There just isn't. Well, you know, you see, you know, So we're back in Contoys, and uh, we're going to continue with our agenda. Um, the next item on our agenda is item 3.0, which are two communications. The first is 3.01, which is a mental health summit synopsis and report. And for this item, you know we have Lacey Smith with us, the community outreach supervisor for BPD. And I'm not sure if there are others. We did have a couple of others who were either maybe joining us on Zoom or are just not here and we have Lacey all to ourselves. Um, thank you for joining us this evening. If you wanna come right up here, we've been looking forward to hearing from you about the summit that was held in September and we've allotted 20 minutes for this item. So if you could maybe keep your comments to about 10 minutes and then we'll have plenty of time for questions from the council. And thank you for your patience and waiting for us. I think I'm all set and I can, I can be brief. Um, hello everybody. Um, as Karen said, I'm the community support supervisor with the city of Burlington out of the Burlington Police Department. I am the supervisor of the community support liaisons which are the civilian social workers um, and different than the community service officers. So um, back in, I wanna say it was uh, April or May, um, myself, Scott Pavick, who came, so he was the replacement for Marielle, so basically the public analyst for the city, myself and Scott Babreco from the United Way started to work on uh, the mental health summit, which was born out of the resolution from the police commission back in October of 2021. So through the summer, we pulled things together. Um, it took us a little while just as we were relying on everybody uh, that were volunteers. So asking, it was convened in August, the end of August, and it consisted of 
a two-day summit that was basically a two-day online meeting twice uh, for two hours each day. Uh, there was about 62 plus participants and we really were trying to uh, trying to understand the mental health summit, the mental health system is very broad and not going to be able to even be very really even touched upon um, in one summit. Let alone, I mean, you'd you'd spend days really trying to understand and analyze the system. So the intentions of this meeting was really to just get the conversation started and to really try to understand where the community were, like what were the expectations of the community? What is their perspective? What do they think the city's role is? And that was really kind of where we started from. So the, really the, the role of what the city is in, in contributing to the, improving the effectiveness of the mental health system, um, the top challenges and opportunities and how can the city help and what are the first steps to take action on these things. So we split it out into two days. Really, day one was a listening day. Day two was really a conversation with all of the folks with breakout groups. So the document that I shared originally was really just the, I just kind of convened all of the working, doc, the working document that was used on day two. This was just a synopsis and just basically cut it and pasted and put it into order. Um, so, that in itself, that's the very fast version of this document. Um, the key takeaways for, I think, as a whole was really just, we all know that there are gaps. We all see the gaps that exist just by living in our day to day, but I, there's not a whole lot of understanding around what is going on to try to fix those gaps, who's doing what, where, when, and, it, is, it becomes even greater because you can think about the mental health system in both a micro way and a macro way. So there's the state and how the state affects our local system and then there's the, our local system and how though our, our designated agency, the private clinicians, how all of them kind of work together and just the, at times, whether it's agency specific, there are barriers kind of that can be identified from both, both on the micro and the macro level. And right now, in the way that there is a table around, so we have the homeless lines for Chittenden, for Chittenden County, and they really kind of look at the system related to houselessness. And then we have Comstat, where we're really kind of really looking at substance use on a both micro and macro level, and the system that goes along with that. There doesn't, there is a state, there are state tables that really exist that look at the state system and the things that need to kind of be changed legislatively. And Howard Center obviously participates in those. But that's the only representation often from Chittenden County. And to me, in my mind, that's a little bit of a gap because although they are the primary and they should be there, there are also other smaller subsections of our community that also work with mental health. And so those voices also don't necessarily have a seat in those conversations. And they might, they could be the same perspective as our designated agency, they could be different. We don't really know because they're not at the table. Um, so from my perspective, that's a gap in terms of just like diversity of voice and understanding of our system issues. Um, so there really is this desire for both communication to be going out into the community to really just kind of understand what is going on, how things are being addressed, and how they can help. Because it's obviously always one of the one things you all hear just as frequently as I do is what can I do. Um, there's also a need for advocacy and just kind of being able to convene. We, have a table where these system conversations are happening and that doesn't exist and that feels like a massive gap. Um, so I think I will leave it. I don't, that though, that to me and from the key takeaways that I just read off the top of the page, that's really the, the meat of it from my perspective. Okay, Lacey, um, thank you. And again, thanks so much for, for taking the time to be here this evening. Um, are there questions from the council or administration on the summit report or um, just questions that we might have for Lacey? Maybe not in general, but 
certainly any other questions that we might have pertaining to the Mental Health Summit. Uh, Councillor Shannon. Thank you, President Paul. Thank you, Lacey. Um, thank you for giving us this report well in advance of our meeting to, to review in the videos that you sent. Um, I've watched, I'll be honest, I watched one. I haven't watched the other yet. But it was really informative, and I'm sorry I wasn't able to make the Mental Health Summit in person. But um, from what I watched, I would say the, um, it was the providers who were speaking to their, their different roles and what they were seeing and experiencing. And um, it certainly struck me that we're, we're so lucky to have people um, as committed as Absolutely. so many people in our community are. Um, they're very much underpaid for their skill and commitment. And the, the, um, The, the thing um, that was mentioned repeatedly was the increasing danger in their jobs. And I guess I have my, um, I think we're all feeling that. And it's, I have my suspicions about what's causing that, but I wondered if you could speak any more um, to that, that there's increasing violence um, and risk to providers that they are seeing now that they didn't used to see. And what is driving that? Wow. Um, it's a very... So, I think... Where do I even start? <laughs> There is, I think that there's always going to be a bit of tension when you're, when, um, and fear that comes with the idea of replacing civilians, replacing officers with civilians, because it's really, in our world, things aren't really black and white. They're exceptionally gray. And we're often just going on like a line or two of information when a call comes in. And so I think from first call's perspective, the, they definitely are struggling in that they often, as did Street Outreach, we don't have the ability right now to co-deploy. So like, first call would go out and call for an officer to stand by, and right now there's times where like, there's no officer to stand by, so the emergency evaluation is just going to sit and wait on the board, and first call won't go out until there is somebody available. So there is a delay in kind of triaging the assistance to folks that are at like, that are potentially in the highest level of crisis, um, simply because there just isn't, we don't have the personnel to be able, and with the information that we have up front, if it's just to do an emergency evaluation, it's not, that in itself doesn't necessarily a safety risk. And if there isn't any additional information that lends to there being a safety risk, it really is just gonna stay as a priority too, and then it's just gonna be dependent upon availability. Unless something kicks it up to a priority one, which would then generate a response. I think we're, collectively as a community, we're coming out of a trauma. We just are coming out of something that shifted our perspectives and our realities greatly with the pandemic. And it really magnified, I think, all of the cracks and, you know, cracks in some places, massive gaps in other places um, within all of our systems. And it really, I think, it wasn't that these issues weren't being worked on before. I think it's just that these things take time. And unfortunately, the, the, what we need to change doesn't happen as fast as people evolve. And so what we're experiencing is really this, like, the, the gaps and, and the need for services right now far outweighs what we can actually provide. And so I did get the good news that Howard Center opened up their wait list for, for adults recently. Um, but, I, like, but, then, like, but I don't know what that actually means. It just means that there's been some progress. But, like, that wasn't... I think part of the communication issue is that like 
there wasn't like, it's not known to the community that these things happen. So by the time it actually gets back to somebody that the wait list is back open, if they're not really connected to anybody, then, and they're not really searching anymore because they tried once and it was difficult, it's just hard, I guess, right now, collectively, being able to, tr to try to actually find yourself seeking services in that moment of vulnerability and then to find out that you really, there really isn't an awful lot out there right now or you're gonna be waiting is, is a, for lack of a better term, a bummer. <laughs> and, <laughs> so, yeah, if we can just let the person who's presenting speak. Thank you. So I, yeah, I think it's complex. And I think until there's like some paradigm shifts a little bit around some things, making access a little easier within various systems, I think it'll still, it's a, a bit of an uphill battle. So if I, can I just follow up? Sure. So if I'm, I just want to, make sure that I am understanding you, is it fair to say that in your opinion, it is, um, it's complex of course, but um, to simplify it, it's the, the increasing gap between need and our ability to meet that need. We have more need than ever and we I don't know, I don't know if we have fewer providers actually. I know a lot of people have left the workforce, a lot of people have left the field. If we're, are we losing providers or is our yeah. providers maintaining a status quo of coming and going and need keeps increasing? Um, I mean, I think it's probably very job specific, but for most, for, well, I say collectively, there is a, there is a shortage in staffing. And I think yes, it is, point of order, Councilor yeah. Paul, point of order, Councilor Paul. What's you, your point of order? I'd ask that you please remember, uh, remind members of the public to respect yeah. council rules. Yeah. No. no, no, I don't think you are. Please stop. Please stop. Please stop. Lacey. Go ahead, please. Okay. Um, so the, you asked about the gap, sorry, I read. The gap yep. between, are we losing people? The, the, the so, net? Okay, so uh, there, there's definitely a sh staffing shortage. So for example, even just hiring for myself, the first time, the first time around with the CSLs, I had 30 applicants and I was able to hire someone people pretty quickly. Um, this time around, I've had about 10. So, and it's been open longer. So I think just even the, a year difference, and this is for a position that pays well, it's def especially for what the minimum requirements are, and there's a ton of flexibility and benefits are really good, and there's just a lot of, a lot more positives to it. Um, <laughs> and I, yeah, so I think that the has the climate has changed in terms of the hiring world currently, and I think you do. It is. It's when you are hearing about the like the breakdowns in these systems, it's really hard to want to motivate motivate to go into something that is really at a fever pitch. It's at a, I mean we're at crisis level kind of consistently in at all of our systems, not just mental health, but we have kind of our hitting a peak with, with. Stop, just, just stop, please. Um, Councilor Shannon, were there any other questions you had? I'm all set, and okay. thank you, thank you very much. I'm really glad that the Police Commission um, moved this forward. Um, I think it's enlightening. I strongly encourage the public to, um, to watch what they can and to read the report. Um, it's an area where I think we, we are absolutely in crisis and need to focus our attention. Thank you. Thank, thanks, Councillor Shannon. Uh, Councillor Jang. Thank you, President Paul, um, and thank you, Lacey, for being here, and thank you for sending this, not today, but since the 24th, and thank you for being patient last time. We appreciate you. Um, 
but I wanted, I wanted to basically just say if this report has been submitted to the Board of Health of the City of Burlington? No, I mean, I've only, I've only shared it with counselors and the mayor's office, so I haven't, it is a public document, I mean, it's something that can be shared, but I didn't, I think the other, I think it would be important to share yeah. it with them. Um, I, because I do think that that's kind of like where this conversation can live, and Absolutely. I do think that like the summit can't just be the only thing that we do. It, this really was just meant to be the start of it. Absolutely. And, so go ahead. Yep, yep. And I think officially, if you can submit it to them, that, yeah. that'd be great because a lot of great, wonderful recommendations are in 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 in, in there. Um, and I think I'm just gonna talk about a quote from the Secretary of Health for the State of Vermont. And if you go to the United Way website, it's right there. It says, effective solution to address the challenges our mental health system faces and that ensure Vermonters can get the care they need without stigma are going to require innovative and sustainable collaboration. This is exactly what the Mental Health Initiative aimed to generate, right? And I think convening the people to talk about it is just one example. Um, and reading the report, you will think that the responses of group number four specifically, all of those are like, can be, um, could have been implemented since it was generated. Very simple, very, and one of them is the city could convene a workshop in improving Work. workplace culture. Mm -hmm. City can help create tables or ways to connecting many non-traditional and non-treatment focused programs in the greater community. I think those could have been done since, since then. And I completely agree, we need someone with the expertise who would look into this and implement them as soon as possible. Yeah. Because this, we are all experiencing what we call um, a sense of urgency, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But I also completely agree, and I'm pretty sure who made that comment? It should be Sarah Carpenter, Councillor Carpenter. About Burlington, definitely um, won't solve this problem alone. No. Yes, and also f f from what we can do basically is to think about how do we convene outside of Burlington and the, just the surrounding communities. Mm -hmm. You know, and work in collaboration with them I think is, is, is key because this requires funding, this requires collaboration, and um, that's definitely the, the next step. And just wanted to say thank you. I watched one of the videos as well, not both of them. And uh, any table that I w attend over the past couple of weeks, they talk about you. Wow. Whenever we talk about mental health, oh, Mary Lacey, your name comes up all the time. So that means that you are doing something great for the city and thank you again for the report thank and you. for everything you do on a daily basis. And Miro, she needs a raise. Thank you. <laughs> I think the hard part for me is that this has lived with me, but like I don't, this feels bigger than me. Um, and I've lived in gaps before, like I was really involved with, the whole, and still am very involved with the Homeless Alliance. But we've built a little bit of city infrastructure that really kind of has direct impact into that system with Sarah's position kind of on the executive administrative side and with the CSLs and my team doing really the outreach and the service connection side. This is, the I could get consumed in this gap and I'm kind of feeling like that's not really <laughs> my, yeah. my area of expertise because there's other gaps that exist like the jail reentry world and that is also a massive gap that we really, and especially in the world of preventative stuff, trying to really maximize connection in that world too feels really important to me, especially considering where I sit. Um, so I'm all for and absolutely feel that something, I just don't, I don't know really where to go with it and happy to shepherd it along and continue to be kind of, you know, the person that is convening it, but really this could be someone's baby um, and really should be in terms of 
just the degree of kind of coordination within our community that is really desired. And I mean, this is a long, it's a long conversation, trying to really understand the difference between, again, like what does the state, what are those barriers? Because they are not identical to the ones that we have on a local level. And how do we simultaneously try to work on addressing both? Um, and part of it is understanding it, which a lot of people, we don't necessarily have that general knowledge. Thank you. Great. Thank, thank you, Councillor Jang. We'll go to Councillor McGee and then try to get on to Point of order, Councillor Paul. Point of order. Point of order. What's your point uh, of order, Councillor I believe members Travers. of the public may believe that they're being supportive of the speaker, but in actuality, they're being deeply disrespectful to our speaker, and I'd ask that you please enforce the council rules. You are, be, you are being disrespectful to the person who is speaking. Please stop. Please stop, Councillor McGee. Thank you, President Paul. Stop. Uh, thank you, Lacey, for providing a uh, synopsis of uh, what was a very important event. No, no. I think point of view. No. Hey, hey, hey. I don't stop. Think stop. I I think if we can remember the fact that we're having this conversation about a mental health summit and just remember our values of de-escalation and just be a little bit mindful of that as a council at this moment, I think that would be beneficial. I'm sorry, you know what, Councillor, Councillor, Councillor Freeman, I cannot hear you over what someone else is saying. I'm happy to recognize you, but I can't hear what you're saying. I think if what I was trying to say, if we need to, we're having a, a conversation about a mental health summit, if we need to have a moment of de-escalation, I think that we can take space for that. I think that that seems to be what's going on. And I don't, I don't know if there's someone there who can maybe assist in that, but I don't think just yelling back and forth is going to, to create your, a. Your point is well taken. Your point is well taken. So I don't we, know if we, we need will, just a we quick will recess. Or we, will, we will listen to you, Todd, during public forum. And we are happy to hear what you have to say then. Thank you. Councillor McGee. Thank you. We appreciate that. Councillor McGee. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Lacey. I was able to attend the first day of the summit and look forward to watching the video from day two. Um, and, you know, there's. There are so many uh, possible paths forward um, that came from the conversation and to the extent that the Public Safety Committee could be a venue for those conversations to continue. I'm absolutely um, willing for that to be the case and eager to um, participate in that. And would also add that uh, like Comstead and the Chittenden County Homeless Alliance, I would like us to move pretty quickly to stand up a similar local uh, group to uh, discuss issues around mental health and gaps in services, uh, especially as we look at another legislative session coming up pretty quickly that uh, will decide a lot of the funding that programs receive uh, in the next year. So um, I, I hope that we can acknowledge a sense of urgency around a lot of these things and that uh, a lot of the decision making will happen on a state level in a few short months and uh, look forward to continuing these conversations in the next couple of weeks here. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Councillor McGee. Uh, Lacey, it was a pleasure having you here. Yeah. Uh, unless there's anyone else, we'll try to move on with our, our next agenda item. Um, okay. And thank you. And thank you so much for being here. Thank you. And thank you for the work you do, as others have said, for the work you do every day. So seeing, other, seeing no other comments, we'll close this item and move on to item 3.02, which is the North Winooski Avenue parking management update. Um, and I believe for this update, we have a, a cross department team from DPW and the Department of Work for, uh, Business and Workforce Development. Um, just, so, just for the benefit of the public, this presentation is in response to the resolution we passed in March regarding the North Winooski Avenue parking and bike lane installation. And with that, I will pass this on to whomever it is that wishes to start speaking first. That would be uh, DPW Director uh, Chapin Spencer. 
we're, we're trying, if we can, to get this in before public forum. So whatever you can do it, to do that and that still allow us some time for some questions. Great. Thank you, President Paul. Uh, brevity will be our order tonight. We are going to hit high wave tops of our uh, memo that was in the council packet and save most of the time for council questions. Pleased to be joined tonight by Public Works Engineer Philip Peterson, Will Clavel, and Carl Al Nasrawi from Business and Workforce uh, Development. And uh, we are here to give an update on the North Winooski Avenue project. Um, as you all have known, we embarked on a two year scoping study that resulted in 2020 of this council approving that study and asking on the northern section of North Winooski Avenue to do additional work around parking impacts. The recommendation of the study calling for bike lanes north uh, in the old north end uh, was uh, going to impact parking. So we went through the parking management plan, brought it to you all in 2022. Uh, as part of the public process, we uh, agreed and recommended and you agreed to phase the work, uh, to look at installing uh, the project uh, between a two block area north of Union Street to Riverside Avenue, and that we were going to employ a multi-pronged strategy to uh, limit the impact of the removal of approximately 40 parking spaces and to maximize the benefit of the reinvestment in the old north end. Uh, I'll have Philip Peterson highlight the top three that he's been working on. I'll finish out and then we'll be open for questions. All right, so uh, one thing that we worked through, uh, through the resolution, uh, $15,000 of seed funding was allocated for transportation demand management grants. We uh, worked with the TUC on allocating those funds and we've, uh, it's all in the memo, so I'll keep it short. Uh, the other thing that I've been working on is uh, geometric issues on North Winooski Ave to see if there's opportunities to increase parking and uh, there's some opportunities there if we put in some curb extensions. And then the active management on street spaces. Uh, so getting an understanding of what the parking needs are on North Winooski Avenue and what kind of time limited spaces that we can put in um, and just working with uh, local residents on, on their needs. Thank you. And three additional strategies we've been working on is developing shared parking at existing parking resources along the corridor. We've been working with uh, property owners and businesses I was pleased that uh, Burlington Housing Authority has preliminarily granted up to six spaces uh, to CHCB, the Community Health Center of Burlington. They are working through that arrangement. Uh, simultaneously, we've been uh, working with the Community Health Center of Burlington since we're one of the larger employers on the corridor to look at off-street parking, new off-street parking capacity. And we have offered our technical engineering help and pledged efforts to find grant funding to help with the construction of uh, some facility. Uh, lastly, uh, and I think uh, Cara and Will can certainly speak to this, continued outreach will be critical. There still are concerns in the Old North End uh, among businesses uh, with this project and the removal of parking. So uh, we have pledged to quarterly updates in your packet with businesses. We have gone door to door as we did with the transportation demand management grants. And we are going to work diligently to carry out the resolution language that you established for us to minimize the impact and enhance the beneficial impact of this project. So with that, we're happy to answer any questions. And I do wanna thank Will and Cara for their help going door to door with us, providing a conduit of information. And uh, as we move forward, uh, you have our, uh, our commitment to uh, deliver this project this summer, 2023. Paving is projected to happen with as much focus we can on, uh, on mitigating any impacts. Thank you. Cara or Will, did you have anything you wanted to offer um, or expand upon before we go to the council or I'm here to answer some questions? Okay, great. Um, so if there are questions from counselors, now is the time.
or comments. Well, I guess there aren't any. Um, oh, Councillor Barlow. Uh, thank you, President Paul. Um, and thanks for coming and bringing this to the council. We went over it at Tuke uh, last month. Um, and I was wondering if um, you could uh, provide additional context around some of the off-street parking opportunities that you're pursuing. Um, if you could just expand on that a little bit, because I thought that was really helpful in my understanding of what's going on. Yes, happy to, Councillor Barlow. Uh, as, you, as the memo describes, we've been reaching out to uh, every business or property owner that has substantial off-street parking that appears that could be used during off-peak times for the general public. Uh, that includes uh, Vermont Legal Aid, uh, Champlain Housing Trust, uh, Hinsdale Properties, um, uh, and then we've met with Burlington Housing Authority and others. So uh, out of that process, there have been concerns of people saying, well, we may have some excess parking, but not always. We're nervous about liability. We're not sure how the shared parking system would work. Uh, so what we have pledged to do, and I think what you're referring to, Councillor Barlow, is develop a turnkey program where the city would offer to manage and enforce off-street parking in off-peak hours for any business or property owner who is interested. And we are looking at a very beneficial uh, revenue split so that we could really tell that partners, so that, so that we could work with those property owners to not only help them financially, but to take take away some of the liability and concerns that they have around how do we manage this, how do we make sure our operations are available for daytime, how do we make sure snow plowing can occur, et cetera. So. Is there anything else, Councillor Barlow? Um, no, thank you for that, because I think that's helpful in providing incentives to businesses to offer their, um, and property owners to offer their their parking might help unstick some of the um, difficulty we've had finding additional off-street parking. So thank you. Yep. Thank, thank you, Councillor Barlow. Um, so, and this will come back to us again. The resolution calls for another update in April. Um, um, if there's no other questions from councillors, we'll uh, thank you for being here and uh, close out this item. We do have a couple of minutes left before public forum, and uh, I don't know how long the informational hearing will take for the schools, but um, maybe we can try to try to fit that one in before. Um, thank you again for your time. Thank you. And uh, I'm sure we'll see you before April, but we'll definitely see you then. Everybody who's young and drunk yep. fucking hates you. Yeah. You fucking horrible hey. Point, point of order. Yes. Um, yes, would it be possible for us to remove um, this, this disruption from our meeting, this the person who can't control themselves this evening? Well, we'll attempt to do that. We'll take a recess. We'll take a recess for, uh, let's take a recess for five minutes.
so thanks so much for thanks so much for indulging us in a short recess. Um, we're going to have to skip ahead from item 4.01 because the time is now 7:30, and that is the magic hour for a public forum. Um, just for those who are here in Contois, a few pieces of information. We have a table in front of us or a table in front of me that has three green light, uh, three lights. One is green and will shine when you begin speaking. The second, um, when you have 30 seconds left, and then the last red light will shine when your time is up. Um, we do have a hybrid system. There are a few couple of people this evening who would like to speak with us that are online. And the way that we run this is we start with Burlington residents, and then we go to non, uh, Burlington residents online, and then back to Contois for non-Burlington residents, and we finish with non-Burlington residents that are joining us via Zoom. Um, uh, the only thing we ask is that you please try to keep your, minute, your, um, your comments to two minutes and there's a timer that will go on behind me for those in Contois and then when we're um, online there's actually a little timer that we will have put up so that you'll know when your time is running, winding down. Um, with that we will go to public forum and there are three people that wish to speak with us, four people that wish to speak with us from, um, uh, that are all Burlington residents. And the first is uh, Todd LaCroix. Todd, the floor is yours. Please come up and speak with us. Um, if you can come to the table, please. Um, that you guys are dealing with now. When I was 15, I went to school with the Bloods and the Crips, surrounded by people like Trump and Epstein. In, I'm not kidding. I saw the future of your civil war in Florida growing up. I was beating up, I was beat up every day for being white by black people at the blackest school in America after the Rodney King riots. And I still grew up to marry a black woman, not being racist. But what I was horrified by, and I'm still horrified by, is that when I came home to Vermont, I saw that all these people, they seemed to romanticize all the gangsters that were beating me up in Florida calling them cool, letting them drug deal and kill our children. And I saw all you people at South Burlington and all you white people. And uh, a KRS-One actually educated me and he said, you know what, 35, no actually he said 75% of uh, rap, gangster rap albums were sold to white girls between 12 and 35. And uh, it made sense when I came home and I saw all you motherfuckers helping the gangsters kill people like me. And then I realized that we're all going to die in a nuclear war because you are all addicted to gangsters. Thank you so much, Todd. Next person is Robert Bristow Johnson to be followed by uh, Thea Lewis. So I was hoping to uh, talk, ab talk about this with you before the, uh, the uh, 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 work session downstairs, but um, I'll say it now. Um, one, the main mistake nine years ago uh, was that we, we defined this new war to be a, a, a utility, an instrument to solve a problem. But uh, what, you know, what War Day was is leftovers in which we kind of just swept under the rug uh, a problem like what to do with the athletic campus uh, uh, so that it was 
for seven of the wards out of mind and, you know, not a problem. But unless you were living in that ward, you didn't like having the city's problems swept into there. Now, um, you can do a non, um, uh, a, a non salamander ward eight that w solves problems. This looks like Texas instead of a salamander, but it takes the Redstone campus, Champlain College, and, and a little bit more and it solves the problems, and it's not a salamander. It's shaped like Texas, it's more compact. But the problem is, is that it still doesn't have any identity, any reason to exist other than to solve these other problems for other places in the city. And so if, you, if Ward 8 is, has an identity, uh, where people who are in it want to be in it or, ha or have an identif identification with other folks in that ward, other than that they just happen to be the unlucky folks selected to be the receptacle for uh, students from UVM, from UVM student housing, um, they might want to keep that ward. They might not, they, that might be a ward to keep. And uh, so that was what I was going to try to tell you and give you some specific information, but the specific information is in the agenda for today. So I don't have to tell you. Thank you. Thanks, Robert. Uh, the next speaker is Rach Margo Margolis. Uh, Rach, it's uh, nice to see you. Please have a seat and uh, and welcome. Thanks. Hi, I'm Rach. Uh, local Burlington resident. Just be sure to be speaking in the microphone and the, the green light should be on in front of you, the little green light on the microphone. Great. Hi everyone, I'm Rach, um, stay-at-home mom here in downtown Burlington. Um, thanks for having me. I'm just here to be a voice to y'all that um, the situation downtown is pretty stressful as uh, a mom. I've been living on South Winooski for the last four and a half years. It feels vastly different when I walk with my children. Um, I'm getting yelled at. My kids hear cursing. Uh, I feel like I'm the only person out shopping at City Market during the day. Um, we're a one-car family household. We're proud of it. But it feels pretty stressful to be out walking with my kids, um, or even without my kids. And uh, I see a very, very, very different scenario than I've seen in the last four years. And my life hasn't changed. I'm privileged to be a stay-at-home mom. Happy to have my kids with me. And uh, thanks for hearing me. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we don't have any other speakers for uh, public forum that are in Contois. Um, however, we do have two that are online. Uh, the first is uh, Sharon Busher and... Um, Sharon, you should be able to speak now. I can. Thank you so much, President Paul. Sure. Um, so I, too, like Robert, had hoped to be able to make comments before you had your work session on redistricting. But I do still want to make those comments. Um, I, I feel that for some um, who don't know Ward 1, that they're thinking that we're selfish and unwilling to change boundaries and and don't really understand the proposed now, I guess it's the central that you're looking at uh, map. Um, I just want to put it in perspective. That section of Ward 1, if you look at your annual report, are where it's the it's the stable long-term resident section, all those streets. It has all of most of the people from that are appointed to boards and commissions. It has all of our election officials. And it also has um, most of our steering committee members. I feel that what you are doing is taking out the stability, the long-term residents and leaving Ward 1 with a population of some long-term residents sprinkled throughout, but mainly 
renters that now are no longer long-term renters. Now, it's been two years since I went door knocking, but I did go door knocking, even though I lost <laughs> the election, I did go. And there were, most of the renters are now revolving door there for two years. So what you've done is erode in this proposal, the stability that once was in Ward 1 and left us with a very unstable ward. And that's really what I've been talking about and trying to put forward. I hope that when um, Councillor Hightower comes back um, that she will have a chance to weigh in on what's being proposed. And I thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Sharon. Our next speaker is um, Next speaker is Erhard Manke, and I have found you and believe that you should be able to speak now. Uh, thanks, uh, Councillor Paul. Can you hear me okay? I have some noise yes. in the background. I'm yeah, we can hear you. We can hear you great. Great. Thanks. So thanks so much. Uh, I, too, had hoped to talk during your uh, or ahead of your work session. Uh, and I'm just speaking as you know, a longtime Ward 1 resident since uh, since the early 80s. Uh, as some of you probably know, I used to represent Ward, uh, Ward 1 and uh, was uh, seatmates with Councillor Busher uh, for a number of years. So, you know, I've looked at the maps. Um, none of them are great for Ward 1. And, and I will confess, I have a somewhat parochial perspective uh, being a long term resident of Ward 1. Uh, but I feel like uh, the maps that you guys uh, discussed during the work session, I was not able to listen to all of it, um, but the ones that you seem to be favoring, uh, the uh, North Hill section maps, they totally eviscerate Ward 1 and the historic uh, cohesion of that neighborhood. I, I agree 100% with everything uh, that former Councillor Busher uh, just said. Um, you're really uh, creating uh, one, uh, you're creating a sacrifice, a new sacrifice zone in my mind, a new sacrifice ward um, that will lose uh, most of its long-term residents, most of whom identify with Ward 1, uh, vote at Mater Christi, are part of the 1 NPA, very active, um, and basically creating a ward of um, mostly uh, short-term renters, lots and lots of students, uh, and a couple of us long-term residents sprinkled here and there. It's, uh, it, it's you're really just creating a new Ward 8, basically, is what you're doing. Um, so that's, that's my comment. Um, I, I hope uh, you can um, you know, fit, figure out some way to fix Ward 1 uh, so it maintains its traditional historic um, neighborhood cohesiveness and, and uh, uh, contiguity, and um, I, uh, yeah, I'll, I'll just, I'll, I'll leave it th at that. Thank you. Great, thank you, and thanks for, thanks to uh, both of you for joining us online, and to those who spoke during public forum. Yes, um, yeah. If you, it, I know, I know uh, time is is precious, and all. And if maybe you could just sit at the table and for another, um, um, for another time. I think it would be uh, appropriate to look into what is going on with the abandoned uh, memorial auditorium where when I was a kid I saw many, many concerts years ago and it's, it's just abandoned there and collected more and more graffiti and I'm wondering if there could be a plan to re-applicate a uh, a, a, a auditorium where they had music and uh, Champlain College used to have basketball there and and um, I think that was a, a thing that we sorely miss in Burlington these days. Thank you. Thanks so much. And before you leave, if you could, if you wouldn't mind filling out a piece of paper so we can have your name for the record, that would be very helpful. Um, uh, thanks for your comments, and thanks to all for your comments during public forum. With that, we will close public forum uh, at um, 7.43. I'm looking up at a map, uh, um, a clock, my apologies, which we normally do. However, it is um, on Eastern Daylight Time, so I'm a little bit confused. <laughs> um, the uh, next item on our agenda is item 4.01. We'll go back to 4.01, which is a public information hearing regarding the authorization to issue general obligation bonds 
to build a new high school and technical center. Uh, this is a requirement that we hold such a hearing to provide voters with an opportunity to ask any remaining questions or offer comments. Um, and it's an informational hearing, so we would welcome any comments uh, from the public and also from any counselors, particularly if you have questions that you've heard from constituents. Uh, we do have with us the chair of the school board, Claire Wool. And Claire, if you want to come up and join us at the table, that would be great. Um, and if there are questions, uh, now would be the time to ask them. If there are questions from the, um, the public um, or if there are questions from the council. And I am going to look to see if there are, um, actually also joining us is Nathan Lavery of the school department. And I see you, uh, I see you uh, Nathan, and have enabled your microphone in case we have any questions um, uh, that, that you can, that you might be able to help us in answering. Thank you. Uh, don't doesn't appear as though there are are there yes uh, Councillor Carpenter. This is an, it's sort of a rhetorical question. Uh, Nathan has been on an email chain with me, educating me to understand how the tax rate will be affected with the bond, and I particularly learned, um, and I'm going to ask Nathan to re repeat for the public. Um, that there's been discussion around how the bond tax rate will affect commercial property. And I've learned, and Nathan can correct me, that the rate for commercial property, the non-homestead rate in the state of Vermont is set by the state, really not by the city and will not be directly affected by the bond. And I'm just trying to get that out as a clarification. And if you could help me out, Nathan, um, with that, because I want the public to understand that. Sure. Yeah, that's uh, that's exactly correct. The non-homestead rate is not set on the basis of any individual district's spending per equalized pupil, unlike the homestead rate, which is. So there is, um, it's only ad adjusted, frankly, by our, our local common level of appraisal. So commercial properties, uh, including rental property, is subject to that non-homestead rate, and that won't change as a direct result of um, of the outcome of the vote, uh, including if BSD ends up borrowing up to 165 million. Thank you. I just thought that was, a, it's very hard to understand all this. And for those who have brought it up, I wanted to make sure that we were clear about that. And there has been some misinformation going around about it. Great. Thank you, Councillor Carpenter. Are there other councillors who had questions or um, the floor is really open during an, inner, um, an informational hearing if there are members of the public who are either joining us in person or joining us online. Uh, you can use the raise hand function if you're online and uh, we can easily recognize you. I just also wanted to note um, Councillor Hightower and Councillor Freeman are both joining us via Zoom. Uh, doesn't appear as though there are any other questions. Um, I'll just check one more time online. I uh, do not see any. Uh, Claire, thank you so much for being here. Uh, Nathan, thank you so much for being here. And I know there are other members of the school board that are also joining us online. Thank you very much uh, for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, with that, we will go on to item number six, which is climate emergency reports. Uh, is there any counselor or the administration who wishes to offer a climate emergency report? Uh, Mayor Weinberger. <clears throat> Thank you, President Paul. Um, had uh, actually uh, several updates uh, for the council on, on the city's climate work. Um, one, there was uh, really quite an exciting event at the airport last week on the roof of the parking garage. It was uh, actually the 
Second time we've had a major press conference on the roof of the parking garage. There's a major solar array that was installed there um, some years ago, um, I believe five years ago, which has contributed uh, to our overall um, standing as uh, the uh, city with the greatest amount of rooftop solar installed uh, photoelectric vault uh, panels in um, New England and one of the top 10 city, uh, cities nationwide. Last week's press conference was to announce the installation of the ORB, which is a new technology. Uh, it is essentially a much more compact wind turbine uh, that is built and designed for urban installations. It can function at and, and, and productively provide energy at lower winds and uh, it works well on urban rooftops. And at least we believe it will, or that's the hope it will. It's a, uh, it's a prototype uh, product that um, seems to have significant potential. It has the potential for greater electricity generation per square foot than solar installations and is a really interesting new technology. It's great to see it being piloted here in Burlington. It's also great the story behind it is that this uh, product was one of the, uh, is being developed by a company that, that went through uh, an accelerator that is hosted at the Burlington Electric Department where about 10, every year about, uh, uh, I believe there are two sessions where we have um, around 20 companies, 10 in each session that um, are given the opportunity to develop new products uh, focus in the energy space and work with BED and, and other resources here in Vermont to advance these technologies. It was exciting to see and let's, let's hope it goes forward from here. Um, I also wanted to share with the council that the um, work has, has continued on the uh, new thermal regulations that uh, flow from the authority of the charter change that was passed last spring in which the legislature approved last year. The BD will be going to um, MPAs throughout November to take input on the concept of regulating new buildings with respect to thermal energy in a new way and we do expect to have a proposal uh, before the, the council in for at least the beginning of discussions in December, giving us plenty of time to go back to the voters on town meeting day um, if there's anything in the new regulations that requires that per, per the ordinance and and, uh, and and in May. So that conversation is, is heating up and we'll be back before you soon, if you pardon the pun, on thermal regulation. <laughs> and. Uh, uh, not entirely unrelatedly, there's also a great deal of work happening right now uh, still with attempts to put the district energy system um, finally over, over the finish line and the council can expect uh, an update on that as well over the last, uh, b before the end of the, the calendar year here. Um, there's been some in interesting important developments there, still uh, not, not uh, final. Um, uh, clarity, but uh, more progress and to, to discuss with the council soon. Thank you, Mayor Weinberger. Are, is there anyone else who wishes to offer a climate emergency report? Seeing none, we'll close that item and continue to item number seven, which is our consent agenda. Is there a motion to move our consent agenda and take the actions as indicated? So moved. Uh, thank you, Councillor McGee. Uh, is there a second to that motion? Seconded by Councillor Bergman. Is there any discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 And all those, any, any opposed, please say no. Uh, we've, improved, we've approved our consent agenda. Uh, before we get to our deliberative agenda, we do have two other meetings that we need to attend to, the Board of Civil Authority, and the city councilor with mayor presiding. So we'll recess the city council meeting at 7.53, and I will pass the floor to Mayor Weinberger, who chairs these two meetings. Mayor Weinberger. Thank you, President Paul. Let's start with the city council with mayor presiding meeting. I'll call that to order um, by uh, at 7.53, and the 
Um, first item on the agenda is a motion to adopt the agenda. Uh, are we ready to take that action or offer any amendments? Uh, motion to adopt the agenda. Thank you, President Paul. It's our second, second by Councilor McGee. Uh, discussion of the agenda. Seeing none, we'll go to a vote. All those in favor of adopting the agenda, please say aye. 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 Are, there any, are there any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. And that brings us to the consent agenda. I would welcome a motion to adopt the consent agenda and take the actions indicated. So moved. Thank you, President Paul. Is there a second? Second by Councilor McGee. Any discussion of the consent agenda? Seeing none, we will go to a vote. All those in favor of adopting the consent agenda, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? That motion carries unanimously. This brings us to the main item of business for this meeting, which is the appointment of a police commissioner for a term expiring June 30th, 2025. Uh, this opening due to a recent resignation um, is, uh, I will open the floor for nominations. Councillor Shannon. Thank you. I will um, nominate Shakuntala Rao, and afterwards I'm going to find out if I pronounced your last name correctly. Oh, good. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> Councillor Shannon, are there any other nominations? Are there any other nominations? I'll ask a third time. Uh, seeing. There are none. Uh, we will close the Florida nominations, and I would like to invite the applicant to join us uh, here at the table if you would like to make uh, a brief a brief statement about your your interest in serving in this role. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, and uh, thank you, Council and President Paul. I have lived uh, in Burlington for 25 years and owned our house at the corner of King and Pine for 19 of those years. I have been involved in community engagement with those living in downtown core for those of those years, including reaching out to my BIPOC neighbors as, and as a BIPOC person myself, who have been dramatically impacted by the increase in day-to-day -day violence and how the police responds to their needs and concerns. I understand how complex public safety is uh, with the role of the police intersecting with mental health, addiction, and availability of guns. I have a PhD in communication. I'm a full professor at State University of New York, Plattsburgh, where I've worked with faculty in our large criminal justice program. I have watched the Nicole uh, online videos, and I am generally familiar with the national models of citizen oversight uh, of local police. I have reviewed commission and departmental documents and have a basic familiarity with the role of the commission. I hope and I'm ready to bring my academic expertise in communication and my personal and community experience and commitment to public safety, inclusion, and equity at the commission. Thank you for your consideration and hopefully your support. Thank you. Great, thank you for your, for your interest and for that statement. Um, I'll come back to the council now. Is there any, any discussion um, about this, uh, about this Nomination. Councilor Jang. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, and just wanted to say for. What's her name? Shikanta. That's a beautiful name. Um, for reapplying again, because it seems you applied before and you did not basically lost um, appetite and you came back. And from my perspective, this speaks a lot about your um, character in serving this city, and uh, you definitely have my vote. Thank you. Councilor Bergman. Um, well, I just want to, as a reference, uh, just thank uh, people for what I hope will be unanimous uh, support for Chikundala. And the comments that the downtown resident made to us in public forum are apropos. Here is an applicant who has been living in the downtown uh, and experiences this is, in, is connected with the community and brings a tremendous amount of um, 
both professional and community experience. I think we would we, 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 would, we would be greatly served if we appoint her, and I look forward to unanim a unanimous vote. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bergman. All right, is there any further discussion? Um, I saw a hand up there, but I think that is uh, not for this, uh, for this discussion. So is, uh, if there's no Further discussion, I will, uh, we will go to a vote. Um, uh, all those in uh, favor of appointing the nominee Shakuntala Rao, uh, please say aye. 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 Um, the ayes clearly have it, and uh, thank you for your, your application, and we look forward to working on you in this uh, critical role at this really important time for the city on public safety. Thank you. With no objection, with uh, all of the business of the City Council of Mayor pre presiding having been addressed, I will close that meeting at 7.59 p.m. and move to the Board of Civil Authority and have that agenda now. Um, the, I uh, would welcome a motion to, uh, I'll call, into, or, uh, call to order that meeting at 7.59 and I would welcome a motion regarding the agenda. Motion to adopt the agenda. Thank you, President Paul. Is there a second and seconded by Councilor McGee? Any discussion of the proposed agenda? Seeing none, we will, uh, Vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? The motion carries unanimously, which brings us to really the only order of business, which is a motion to adopt the consent agenda and take the action indicated. Are we ready for that motion? So moved. Thank you, President Paul. Is there a second? A second by Councilor McGee. Discussion of the motion, seeing none, we will go to a vote. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? The motion carries unanimously, and we have completed the work of the Board of Civil Authority, and without objection, I will close that meeting at 8 p.m., and I believe hand the gavel back to you, President Paul. Thank you, Mayor Weinberger. So we'll reconvene the recessed council meeting at uh, 8.01, and, we and we'll continue with um, item number eight, which is our deliberative agenda. We have six items on our deliberative agenda. The first is item 8.01, which is a communication from Mayor Moreau Weinberger regarding the appointment of an assistant city attorney. And with that, I'll turn the floor back to you, Mayor Weinberger. Thank you, President Paul. I am really pleased to bring forward tonight with the support of Acting City Attorney Kimberly Sturdivant and the Full Search Committee, the appointment of Kyle Klaus to be an Assistant City Attorney. And I believe Kyle has joined us remotely. Those of us in the room can see him on the, uh, in the upper right uh, on the screen. Kyle will bring needed capacity and impressive breadth of experience to the city attorney's office. Kyle's got strong Vermont connections. He was, uh, he's a graduate of Vermont Law School, currently is working in private practice in his home state of New Jersey where he specializes in municipal law, including land use regula regulation, zoning, labor, and employment law. Kyle has clerked in both the Superior Court of New Jersey and the U.S. District Court of Massachusetts, and his resume demonstrates a curiosity and professional commitment in the areas of law important to our city as we confront the challenges ahead and work to meet our goals around housing and homelessness, climate action, and racial equity. To highlight just some of his relevant recent work experience at VLS, he was an assistant to Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Diversity Dean Shirley Jefferson. Prior to graduating law school, he researched housing policy for Cambridge City Councilor Sabrina Wheeler and Boston City Councilor uh, Michelle Wu, now the mayor of the city. Uh, his knowledge and experience practicing municipal law and his enthusiasm 
for areas of policy that will support the goals of the Burlington community. We'll make him an outstanding team member in the city attorney's office, and uh, I'm pleased to welcome him to the city team. Know that Burlingtonians will benefit from his work, and I hope he'll have strong support from the council tonight. Uh, if it's uh, amenable to you, President Paul, um, I was hoping to give Kyle an uh, opportunity to briefly address the, the council about his interest. Of course. Thank you, uh, Mayor. It's, a, it's fantastic to speak with you all tonight. Um, as the mayor mentioned, Vermont is very near and dear to my heart. Uh, I graduated from Vermont Law School and uh, had a fabulous time there, um, really formative years. And uh, I actually met my uh, now fiance. One of our <laughs> earliest dates was um, to Burlington. Uh, we saw this guitar prodigy at Nectar's. Um, so, so thank you in a way. Um, but I, I couldn't be more excited to, to move up there and and get started and um, I'll defer to you all. Great, thank you very much, Kyle. Um, uh, back to you, President Paul. Thank you, and thank you, uh, Mayor Weinberger, and thank you to Attorney Kloss for being here. Uh, uh, for the communication and the, and the remarks. Uh, Councilor Bergman, I will look to you for a motion on this confirmation. Well, I would move uh, the um, appointment of the uh, the nominee and uh, just briefly ask for the floor back. Great, uh, thank you, Councilor Bergman. Uh, motion made by Councilor Bergman and seconded by uh, Councilor Travers. Uh, Councilor Bergman, you, uh, you have the floor back. Just very briefly, uh, the resume, I think, uh, speaks to a breadth of interest um, uh, and expertise that we need as a former 20-year uh, member of that office, um, it gives me great pride to be able to, uh, to, to nominate people who I think will do us a great uh, deal of uh, service. And I thank the mayor for the good work that, uh, that the team did to, to get this applicant. Those are, certainly, those are certainly meaningful words coming from you, Councilor Bergman, after all the time that you <laughs> spent in that office. Um, before we go to a vote, are there any other councilors who wish to offer any comments? Seeing no other comments, we'll go to a vote. Uh, all those in favor of the motion to confirm Kyle Kloss as an assistant city attorney, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. The motion passes unanimously. Congratulations, Attorney Kloss, and we welcome you to Burlington. Thank you very much. I can't wait. Have a good night. Uh, with that, we will move on to uh, item uh, 8.02 while we're on a roll with appointments. Um, and this is a communication from, again, from Mayor Moreau Weinberger regarding the appointment of racial of the Racial Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging Director. Uh, Mayor Weinberger, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Paul. Yes, I am uh, very excited to have a, another appointment for your confirmation tonight, the appointment of Kim Carson to be our next Director of Racial Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging. And Kim is uh, here with us uh, tonight. And, and uh, Kim, why don't you come up and, and, and join us here at the table. Since creating this position in uh, late 2019, the REIB department has gone through tremendous growth and taken on numerous critical initiatives to advance equity within our local government and throughout the Burlington community. Uh, I want to recognize Acting Director Pitt Kiamanavan and the entire REIB team for their work uh, over the course of 2022. Pitt stepped forward at a critical time to provide departmental focus and, and leadership and the REIB staff did a great job under challenging circumstances, pushing forward many critical initiatives over recent months. Kim comes to the city team f from Iowa, where she served uh, recently, very recently, as the Director of Education and Human Capital Development for the Iowa Judicial Branch. In her position, she led judicial education and professional development for nearly 2,000 employees and provided strategic leadership for diversity and equity initiatives across the agency. She brings extensive experience to the role of REIB director in training, social justice advocacy, and organizational cultural change. 
Before her career in the judiciary, Kim worked as a collegiate track and field coach in Iowa and for USA Track and Field. Kim's been inducted into the LSU Athletic Hall of Fame and competed at the 1996 U.S. Olympic Trials. In my early conversations with Kim, she made it clear to me that from that background, she greatly values teamwork, which is something that I always look for in department head appointments. When I brought forward the creation of this position in my 2019 budget, working closely with Councilor Jang and, and others, uh, which was readily approved by the City Council, it was with the vision that to advance rapidly on racial equity issues, we needed a department focused on that issue and that simultaneously the values of racial justice and equity must be fully integrated across the city's initiatives, efforts, and management. Leading a department with such a, a broad and, and critical mandate is a major challenge. I'm very excited to be bringing forward for confirmation an individual in Kim Carson who possesses the skills, education, training, work experience, and values to succeed in this key leadership role. With the combined skill and dedication within the REAIB department, with the resources that we've together, the administration and the council together, dedicated to the mission of racial equity, inclusion, and belonging, and with Kim's leadership, I am confident that the City of Burlington will be well equipped to continue the urgent work of ending racial disparities and fostering a sense of belonging in Burlington for all. And with that, uh, President Paul again, would uh, welcome the opportunity to have Kim address the council about, about her appointment. Thank you, Mayor and uh, Council. Um, can you hear me okay? I kind of have a coach booming voice, so I try to be careful when I'm in front of uh, microphones. But I just want to say thank you, and um, I'm really excited to be here today in person, actually, and have the opportunity to sit in front of you and tell you how excited and honored that I am to be being put forward to the council for this position. I um, do not take this lightly in any way. Um, bigger than that, it's the um, time, and I think I said this when I spoke to the media, my career that I could make a choice on where I wanted to be. And I just really feel called to the city of Burlington. Um, I brought my children here and they love it. And so I'm just really, really excited to have the opportunity to integrate within the community and be a part of the community that I think is primed and ready for change. So thank you. Thank, thanks very much. Did you have anything else you wanted to? I did not, President Paul, thank you. Okay, so thank you for those comments and Kim, thank you for your inspiring remarks as well. Um, uh, for a motion on this confirmation, we'll go to Councilor Jang as a, the chair of the REIB committee and a member of the search committee. Thank you, uh, President Paul, and uh, I will move to the appointment of Kim Carlson as the Director of the Racial Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging for the City of Burlington. And after a second, to uh, ask for the second, to ask for the floor back for a few minutes. Sure, of course. Um, so a motion made by Councillor Jang and seconded by Councillor McGee. Uh, Councillor Jang, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, President, and I would like to start by saying welcome to the City of Burlington and also to thank all members of the hiring committee um, that work extensively with the director of the HR to bring, you know, to where we are today, to bring us here together. I also want to congratulate both the acting director, Pat Niobian and Bellant for their interest in the position to lead the department and for being part of the trip finalist um, that, you know, for this appointment. So as you know, REIB is a newest city department that has so much potential, so much potential in truly providing a more just, equitable city for each and every single one of us that call Burlington home. It is with no doubt that um, Kim has the charisma, she also has the professional experience and the know-how that will invest help her invest in the much needed work to rebuild the REIB department and to do its important work of leading efforts of creating a more just Burlington for all. Kim, please rest reassured that you will be challenged. But please never lose sight of your responsibilities of ending racial disparities and foster a chance of belonging. Burlington is great of people with so much wisdom, 
and also passion of rebuilding this city. And uh, please know that they all open their hands in welcoming you here. Welcome to the city of Burlington and congratulations. And thank you, Mr. Mayor, for making the right choice here. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you Councillor Jang, for those meaningful remarks. Um, are, there, are there any other councillors who wish to offer remarks before we go to a vote? Seeing none, then we'll go to a vote. Um, all those in favor of the motion to confirm Kimberly Carlson as the next Director of Racial Equity, Inclusion and Belonging, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Uh, that motion passes unanimously. Congratulations, now Director Car Carson, and uh, to you, and a heartfelt welcome to your family who we will look forward to meeting. Uh, we're anxious to get to work with you, and we're excited to support and elevate this important work. So congratulations. Thank you. So with that, we will move on in our deliberative agenda with item 8.03, which is an ordinance, uh, um, comprehensive development ordinance parking, minimum and maximum parking requirements, and transportation demand management, which is ZA 22-07. Uh, for this item, I'll turn to the chair of the ordinance committee, Councillor Travers, and just also wanted to note that we do have joining us uh, via Zoom, the Director of Planning, Megan Tuttle. Uh, Councillor Travers. No, please do. <laughs> President Paul, could I call for a short two minute recess, please? Of course, All we'll right. recess for a couple of minutes. All right, thank you. Please don't go far.
recess. Uh, for those who watch council meetings, they always you always know that a two minute recess is never really two minutes. I think it was only five, but we're we're do, we're doing well. Uh, so I'll move back to I believe we left off with uh, Councilor Travers. You having the floor. Uh, thank you, President Ball. Uh, I would move to uh, refer. Um, the version of the ordinance uh, marked as final on the agenda on 8.03, uh, back to the ordinance committee uh, to report back for our council meeting on December 5th. And with a second would ask for the floor in return. Okay, uh, motion made and seconded by Councillor Jang. Uh, Councillor Travers, you have the floor back. Thank you, President Paul. Um, so as folks who have been following this matter know, it's been an item that uh, we have um, had before our agenda a number of times now and sort of continued to, to move along. But uh, it's an item that I think is important to our community to meet a number of important goals. And to that end, I think it's important uh, that we get it right. Um, and part of getting it right is that uh, this proposed ordinance change touches on minimum parking requirements and uh, so-called TDM, transportation demand management requirements that were, uh, for at least the multimodal district, just put into effect by this council a couple years ago. Uh, so day by day, we, we still continue to hear feedback um, from projects uh, in the downtown district in particular with respect to uh, the opportunities and challenges uh, presented by the changes that were made not all that long ago. So just to sort of frame what this ordinance would do for folks, um, the council acted a couple years ago to waive minimum parking requirements in the multimodal district. There are two other parking districts in the city, the neighborhood district and the shared use district. And the proposal that's before the council now would waive the minimum parking requirements uh, in those districts so they would be waived citywide. There are currently in place citywide uh, maximum parking requirements as well. Uh, as I understand it, uh, the proposal before the council right now would make uh, no changes with respect to the existing maximum parking requirements, but would rather um, lay them out differently uh, in, in a table um, that from my perspective and the perspective of many is, is easier to read uh, and to follow, although that has been a point of confusion for some who have been following um, this legislation. Uh, the other piece outside of the minimum parking requirements is the uh, requirements of the transportation demand management program. And there are four requirements that are outlined under that. One is an education and outreach component. A second is various TDM strategies, such as requiring that uh, projects of a certain size uh, purchase uh, bus passes, uh, purchase car share memberships. Uh, or engage with the Transportation Management Association to uh, offer um, equal, same, similar benefits. Um, there's another section um, that requires that projects uh, of, of 10 or more dwelling units uh, or commercial projects of a certain size uh, engage in parking utilization studies uh, every year for the first 10 years of the project, um, build certain uh, priority spaces, uh, including dedicated spaces for car share memberships. Um, and there's a uh, provision as well uh, that requires that uh, these projects all submit a TDM plan to the city that must be followed going forward. My sense in working on this and trying to finesse it with different folks and stakeholders over the last few meetings is that there seems to be general consensus around um, we, we would like to, as a community, extend the waiver of minimum parking requirements, which has stood as an, as an obstacle to development of more housing and more density in our community. And, and there seems to be general consensus behind that. Um, where there's been a number of questions uh, have been around the extent to which uh, we would like to expand uh, the TDM requirements that have been placed on downtown, pro downtown projects. I think that the TDM, the goals here are, are laudable ones. And if you look to other communities around the country that have uh, put TDM requirements into place, uh, like San Francisco, for example, I think is sort of the lodestar uh, for, for TDM uh, nationwide. Uh, you know, if you go online and, and Google the San Francisco TDM program, it'll bring up 
you know, multiple pages of uh, a menu of different options that projects in uh, San Francisco are, are able to select from uh, to really tailor their transportation demand um, benefits to the specific project. Uh, I understand the concerns that have been raised by some that um, our TDM ordinance as it's written right now for downtown projects doesn't really allow uh, for that tailoring of transportation benefits uh, to um, particular projects like other communities have allowed for. So uh, I think the debate here seems to be focusing on um, the extent to which uh, we would like to expand these TDM requirements, and I don't know if it's a question of if we should expand them rather than how we should expand them. I know um, we have Director Tuttle here, it appears. Director Tuttle, I don't know if um, it would be in, in order on the motion to uh, refer it to committee here to hear from you. I understand your department uh, has been uh, working on an RFP uh, on um, our community getting feedback on uh, how we should operate with respect to uh, TDM requirements, and I'm wondering if it would be in order for you to weigh in on this at that point, at this point in time. Uh, Director, <laughs> Director Tuttle, there you are. Sure, uh, happy to. Um, yes, I, I do think that you, Councilor Travers asked the question about, you know, whether the concern at this point is whether to or how to expand TDM to other parts of the city. And I, I do think that um, we have been talking largely about how to in the discussions that I have been involved with at uh, the ordinance committee and the planning commission level at, up to this point. Um, the impact fee study that our office is currently soliciting consultant support for would help us to evaluate that question. Um, including kind of who is the right person to help us lead that, whether these standards are best situated in a land use policy like zoning, or if there are other models we should consider, and will also help us evaluate some of the strategies that have been implemented um, or have been studied within our community in the past that have not been successful yet to help us understand what may provide a successful route for us in the future. Thanks, Director Tuttle. And are you able to speak to what the status of that RFP is? Has it been issued yet? Have we received any responses? And either way, when you anticipate that study may be completed by? Yes, that uh, request for proposals has been issued. It's currently open. Uh, we are accepting proposals. We, um, the deadline for those proposals is at the end of this month. Um, we have had inquiries about it. And so we're hopeful that we will have several great applications or several great proposals for that. Um, our work plan anticipates that that will take a majority of 20, uh, 2023 for that work to be completed. And we would anticipate that at the time of the completion of that study, uh, we would have another opportunity to evaluate our policies related to TDM. Thank you, Director Tuttle. Um, so just uh, finally, from my perspective, I, I don't think, uh, at least personally, my intention is that we uh, not wait until the end of 2023 to reach the bigger goal here from my perspective, which is the elimination of minimum parking requirements citywide. Um, I should say as well that uh, there's another goal here that we have heard from a number of affordable housing organizations in Burlington who are concerned with um, the TDM requirements as they are laid out in the ordinance right now, and I think we need to make sure that we are tailoring an amendment that speaks specifically to nonprofits so as to not inadvertently create a further hurdle to the development of affordable housing. So I'm glad that we're taking a further look at this. Uh, our intent as chair of ordinance will be to report back on this uh, for our December 5th meeting and hopefully to return a package that includes the elimination of the minimum parking requirements and includes uh, uh, tailored uh, TDM requirements that can secure majority support of this council uh, while also taking into, it, into account the comments from Director Tuttle um, being that we do have this study coming and I think regardless of what we end up doing here, um, this should be and from my perspective will be an item that we return to uh, whenever we receive the results from that work. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Travers, and also to Director Tuttle for being here um, for that background on the RFP. Um, 
Uh, if there, there, Councillor Bergman is interested in offering comments and questions. If there are others, please let me know. Um, we'll come uh, after. Uh, Councillor Bergman. So I support the uh, the referral. I think that we um, need to take the time to do this. I am in favor of flexibility and trying to come up with um, a right approach currently to uh, to our transportation demand management strategies. Um, I have been working to uh, to deal with the issues raised by the affordable housing groups and believe that we have come up with something that is uh, very workable and, um, and acceptable um, in terms of the, uh, the, both the burdens and the benefits that we need to get as a community. Um, I do not know that without TDM that we have got the type of unanimity, unanimity um, or consensus around the elimination of parking minimums. Um, and I say that really clearly. There is um, an unbridled faith that if we give this major subsidy to developers that, that, that the market will magically turn uh, that into a decrease in uh, rental housing costs or other costs. I do not share that um, unbridled optimism in the magic of the market. I'm sorry to tell those that uh, might uh, not, not be pleased with that, but that is just the way I, I believe. I have not seen that to, uh, mm. to have occurred. That being said, um, I have said here before that this planet is burning and we have got to do everything we can to change the way that we do things. And that includes in the transportation sector, the, uh, the need for us to transition away from the use of fossil fuels in that sector, 40% of our emissions are coming from that sector. We have got a woefully inadequate transportation system here for the needs uh, that our climate takes. Anybody can see that. And so we have got to do everything we can to bend that curve. We are fiddling while this planet burns. I, I sometimes wish that um, I could speak as loudly as Todd, but I don't. And I know that you know some people think that we're doing a lot or we're doing enough. I, I see the shakes of the head. I don't buy it. I think we have to do more. And so for me, the linkage of the the, the parking minimum uh, elimination, which will socialize the cost of parking while allowing the privatization of that profit is, um, is something that I am just totally against. And I, um, I hope that we can come up with something that will move us forward. I, as you have heard and as you have seen, I personally have, I think, been practical and willing to work with y'all across the boards to do the right thing and to move us as far away as far as we can. But um, there are certain lines that, uh, that should not be crossed. And I hope that we can get to the point in the ordinance committee, and I will do everything I can to assist that process, um, that we can come together with a TDM program that works for the rest of the city. And in two years, when we get all this study back, then we'll, uh, we'll be able to take a look at that. But truth be told, that's a long time out. And let me just end, we, took, we had a study in 2015, it's been sitting on the shelf. We had a study in 2018, it's been sitting on the shelf. We can study and study and study and meanwhile, the planet is burning, and we've got to change the way we do business. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bergman. We'll go to Councillor Shannon. Thank you, President Paul, and um, thank you, Councillor Bergman. I, I agree with a lot, a lot of what you said. Um, as this goes back to committee, and and really, 
thank you, Councillor Travers, for being willing to take this back to committee and trying to find a path forward, as you always do. Um, that's really a consistent pattern with you, I'd like to note. Uh, I, I, um, I also have reservations about um, eliminating the um, minimum parking requirements in, in the neighborhood parking districts, having um, reached out to my constituents and heard a lot from them, but not only for that reason, um, and particularly, I had, some, I had some really interesting feedback I wanted to share from one constituent who I will just call the guru, guru in the um, bike ped community, who surprisingly, when I asked the question about how do you feel about eliminating minimum parking requirements, um, this person who's no fan of cars, obviously, uh, said, no, I don't think you should um, eliminate minimum parking requirements because it's going to make it harder to get bike lanes on the street if all the cars, if you don't have off-street parking, then that, that uh, on-street parking is gonna be more essential. But then I had a chance to talk to him today, actually, um, and get a little more of his, his thoughts and detail, and particularly where um, there's, there's advantages to slowing traffic of having cars on the street um, in, in the neighborhoods, but in those areas where we're trying to put in bike lanes, in those corridors, and they have been laid out, um, that is a place specifically where we should be looking to require off-street parking. And I don't think we've, uh, I had not heard this perspective before. I think it's an important perspective, and we know how challenged we are every time we want to put in bike lanes, and it has, uh, it has a real impact oftentimes on our lower income neighbors. I know it's my lower income neighbors that are most impacted when uh, we, we get parking enforcement come through the neighborhood and everybody gets ticketed and a lot of people get towed. And that is devastating to our low income neighbors who rely on their cars to get their kids to doctor's appointments to get to work because as Councillor Bergman says, we really don't have another system on which to rely at this point. And I think there's broad agreement at this table that we need to build that system. And it's very challenging because really we need a regional system. We don't just need to get from the south end to the new north end. So uh, I think that this uh, provides another opportunity to try and, and get this right. And um, thank you very much for being willing to do that. Thank you, Councillor Shannon. I uh, don't see any other councillors, um, and with that, we'll uh, go to the mayor for some comments. Thank you, President Paul. I actually, want, I do have some comments, but also wanted to just clarify procedurally what, what Councillor Travers is proposing here and how this affects, because I, I don't believe there will, there will need to be what I think is being characterized as material changes for this ordinance to, I think, get through this body and, uh, and, and, and pass my desk. So uh, given that there will need to be material changes, does this, can you lay out how, what kind of warning requirements there are and how that intersects with this idea of not coming back for another month? Councilor Travers? Yeah. Um, so uh, we have City Attorney Sturdivant here, but I think I may be able to uh, accurately relay what I understand um, the standard is. So um, these changes are governed by state statute, where if at this point in time, where we're sort of at the end of the road with this process, um, if this council makes changes that are substantial enough, um, we would need to uh, warn it again after we make those changes for a final, final hearing. Um, and so this being sent back to the ordinance committee uh, to come back to this council on December 5th, um, I anticipate that the changes in there may be substantial enough such that if the full council were to then vote on an amended version on the 5th, uh, then we would need to warn it for uh, a, a final hearing once more uh, after that. That is my okay, so then we would not we would not be taking action on the fifth, other than to warn it for another hearing. 
Correct. If whatever amended version comes and out. And does of that Washington. start to then, do we still, so then you're pushing another 21 days or something beyond the 5th, and does that, what is there, I believe we're getting near the end of the council's ability to act on this without starting the whole planning commission council once again, planning commission process once again? I could. I confirmed that earlier today, and the Planning Commission took final action on this in June, uh, which started the one-year clock for us to take action. And so I believe we would have sufficient time if we acted on the 5th to I still see. have okay. a final hearing. Is that, is that may, correct? Oops. Yes. Go ahead. That is correct that the amendment will be in a position to be acted on by the Council until June of next year. Um, there's a different kind of deadline in front of the council at this point, though, which is that um, this ordinance, as it was written for your public hearing back in August, I believe it was, is currently in effect. The, the Department of per Permitting and Inspections is currently administering this ordinance as if it were adopted, and that is per state statute. That um, applicability will go out of effect in December. So that will just it will put us in a position of no longer implementing that um, basically from the end of December until your action on it. Okay, thank you for clarifying uh, everyone's clarification there. Uh, um, I would so think confusing those, uh, it was unclear the distinction between those two. Um, I, I think it's, Unfortunate, we're not in position to, to take action tonight. Um, I, I uh, the um, primary impact of this change uh, will be to make it possible to build more homes in Burlington, which is a hot crisis and one that uh, very directly goes uh, to the uh, climate emergency as well. Making it possible to build more homes has a vastly greater impact on the climate impact this community has uh, than the modest changes to our transportation patterns that we can hope to achieve through the creation of a new TDM system uh, over time. I'm a supporter of trying to create a TDM system. Uh, I disagree with the characterization. This is something we've studied before. The, the studies that have been done in 2015 and 2018 had to do with specific employer-only uh, plans uh, and how those employers could I increase uh, their TDM impacts. What we're talking about now uh, is potentially, I think, a far more impactful uh, systems creation where we would actually have a TDM we would attempt as a city to really uh, be using all the levers we could, just one of which, uh, and maybe not even a very powerful one of which, is uh, our permitting uh, approval for new projects to create an actual uh, TDM system that benefits all, uh, that really attempts to be, attempts to be a comprehensive system. Um, However, even if we get that, do all the work to pioneer a new system, which hasn't been done anywhere in the country effectively, and uh, create something new that has an impact, it is hard to imagine that those changes to, to, uh, to transportation behavior will have anywhere near the impact of the difference of having a climate impact of having a home in Burlington versus a, another home built in the suburbs or exurbs of Chittenden County. We know that People who live in Burlington, no matter whether they use single f cars or not, have a vastly smaller carbon footprint than those in outer line communities. And you know, the word fiddling was suggested. It, it is, it is, it is fiddling with the housing crisis while there are enormous demands uh, for us to build new housing to. Uh, to keep waiting and, and, and keep delaying on taking an action that we know will be a pro-housing action that will make it more likely that homes get built in Burlington. The idea that fixing bad policy is somehow uh, that has led to the dramatic overbuilding of, of parking uh, in new construction in Burlington for decades, the idea that fixing that becomes a subsidy is, is, is a subsidy is I really kind of think turning on its, on its head um, what we're debating here and what's, what's at stake. We should, 
not be putting artificially, we should not be allowing artificial, wasteful policies to drive up the cost of housing, which is what we've done for decades, and we should stop doing it as soon as we can. So uh, I think it's unfortunate that we can't uh, be moving forward with this. It's clear that there um, is no way to put a good TDM policy in place until we have this study. Um, very rarely in the decade that I've been working with this council have I seen us take action first and then study the uh, policy later. We've only done that a couple times. I think we all can think of and bad things have flowed from that. Um, that was the concern that was raised about the TDM policy that was put in place when we uh, eliminated parking minimums in the downtown on transportation corridors, numerous people raised the concern that we should not be putting in place a new system until, uh, in, until the study was done. But there was not the only way to get that important uh, policy change at the time was to try something. Well, now we've tried it for a couple years. And we know that the TDM system, as I've articulated in the memo to you earlier, we know the TDM systems that are in place have problems. They are negatively impacting housing. Uh, they, the provisions that were written into them for compliance are not working out as intended. And that's what happens when you make policy before properly studying it and laying it out. So uh, we, there's no way to do this right. There's no way to do this and do it right until the study is complete. It will be very unfortunate if uh, half the this Council holds up progress on housing policy uh, because it can't be done simultaneous with TDM policy that isn't ready and that we're working actively on and we'll have an answer for in the future. Thank you, President Paul. Uh, thank you, Mayor Weinberger. Uh, given that this is a motion to refer uh, and seeing no other counselors in the queue, we'll go to a vote. So the motion, the motion is to refer the ordinance back to the ordinance committee with a full report back a report back to the full council at our December 5th meeting. Uh, all those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Uh, that motion passes unanimously, uh, which moves us on to item 8.04, uh, the Board of Health resolution on the prevention of gun violence. And for this item, which will also be a referral to the council's Public Safety Committee, we have uh, Celia Bird with us um, and uh, would encourage you to come forward and um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for being with us. We've tried to, allo we've allotted about 15 minutes or so for this, so if you could uh, give us a brief overview in the about five minutes or so and then we will go to questions from the council. Thank you, thanks again for being here. Thank you. Uh, good evening, President Paul, city councilors, Mayor Weinberger. Thank you for this opportunity to speak to you. I'm Celia Bird, Chair of Burlington Board of Health, here with Board of Health member Jenny Tomzak to present on behalf of our board our resolution on the prevention of gun violence. Increasing gun violence in our city and the nation is a public health emergency. We serve as your public health citizen advisory group and are aware that this health and safety risk concerns many, many citizens. So tonight we ask for your support of the public health evidence-based framework that we have written as an approach to effectively address and prevent gun violence in our city of Burlington. You've received our resolution, so we hope that you'll take time to consider it thoroughly. Jenny is now going to describe its components so that we can answer any questions that you have tonight. Thank you again for presenting us. With if you could just make sure your microphone is on by pre may pressing the little button in front of you so we can hear you. There you go. Is that working? Okay. Um, it should turn green. Yeah, it's green. There you go. First, I would like to recognize and express our deep sorrow as a community for the loss of health and life of our fellow citizens due to gun violence. Um, 
in terms of the resolution you have. Uh, the first section prevents the staggering human and economic toll of gun violence on our nation, which disproportionately affects communities of color. Describes how Vermont has a higher than average rate of suicide and domestic violence homicide, most often committed with guns. It describes how Burlington residents voted by a two-thirds majority to enact three charter changes to address gun violence in our community, which have been stalled in the state legislature for eight years. It describes how gun violence within our city has risen dramatically recently from an average of two incidents per year for a decade to 12, 14, and 25 gunfire incidents in the past three years. Like our nation, our city is desperate for meaningful change and our mayor has responded by implementing multiple public safety initiatives. As commissioners of the Board of Health with a duty to promote and protect the health of Burlington citizens, we suggest here additional measures to address the public health crisis of gun violence in our city. First, we must insist that the state legislature recognize the right of Burlington citizens to enact reasonable firearm laws to protect themselves tailored to the unique circumstances of our locality. You also see the list at the end where we suggest meaningful public health steps to prevent gun violence, such as those which address the root causes of gun violence and have been recommended by gun violence prevention research groups to have the highest impact. We suggest creating an Office of Gun Violence Prevention to coordinate and oversee these and other initiatives and to be sure that we address gun violence with racial equity, social determinants of health, and trauma-informed solutions. We need to improve data collection and reporting to guide evidence-based initiatives and to assess their efficacy. Um, in addition, we should protect and support survivors of domestic violence, partner with schools and school boards to promote gun violence prevention, partner with other agencies to address and prevent mental health issues, provide and promote guidance of safe for safe storage of firearms in the home and provide facilities where veterans and others can temporarily store their firearms in moments of crisis. Again, an Office of Gun Violence Prevention would be very useful to coordinate and oversee these and other initiatives. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Before we take your questions, I just would like to say that I believe and we believe as the Board of Health that every single person in the city of Burlington deserve to live life free of gun violence. As a council, you address other threats to public health by implementing reasonable solutions. Please act on this opportunity to continue to protect and serve your constituents and our community by using our resolution as a public health framework to prevent gun violence. We hope that you bring this to the Public Safety Committee and create a resolution that can be passed by the full council in December. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jen, and thank you, Celia, for both being here and for this update. Um, before we go to councilor comments and questions, we'll go to a motion uh, from the chair of the council's public safety committee, Councillor McGee. Thank you, President Paul. I would move that we refer this uh, resolution to the public safety committee and ask for the floor back after a second. Right, thank you, uh, thank you, Councillor McGee. Uh, seconded by Councillor Jang. Uh, Councillor McGee, you have the floor back. Thank you. Thank you both so much for presenting the resolution tonight and to all the members of the Board of Health for the substantial work that's gone into getting it to this point and bringing it to the Council. Um, I very much uh, am eager to have the Public Safety Committee get to work on this and uh, have a Council resolution back to the full body before uh, the end of December so that we can make clear the city's commitment to gun violence prevention um, and anti-violence work uh, before the legislative session begins because so many of these changes require state action before, uh, before the city can uh, take meaningful steps to address gun violence here in the city and all forms of violence. Um, so with that said, I'll. Uh, open the floor up for questions, I suppose, and uh, thank you. Thanks, Councillor McGee. Uh, are there any councillors who would like to offer uh, comments or have questions on the motion before us? Uh, Councillor Travers. Thank you, President Paul. Uh, I, I just want to thank the Board of Health for 
the great amount of work that they've put into this. I know that you and, and your other members <clears throat> have been reviewing this for some time. And uh, while I'm not a member of the Public Safety Committee, I thank uh, Councillor McGee and the members of that committee for taking this on. And, and I'm excited about uh, what comes back. You know, our, our tools right now as a city uh, are too limited uh, for us to be able to uh, address this issue. Uh, I think our ordinances right now prohibit possession of firearms only in our parks and cemeteries. And other than that, uh, our ordinances uh, only uh, prohibit the discharge of firearms within the Burlington city limits. I think Burlington voters a few years ago uh, made it very clear uh, that uh, we here in Burlington uh, wanted to be able to take more uh, reasonable gun reform measures. I'm uh, frustrated that the legislature has not taken action on that. I'm excited that you've provided us this uh, tool for us as a council to take this on and, and look forward to uh, what we can get done by the end of this year such that, such, uh, such that our uh, partners at the state uh, know where the city stands when folks get back to Montpelier come January. Thank you, Councillor Travers. Uh, we'll go to uh, the mayor. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, Mayor Weinberger. Thank you, President Paul. Um, I too wanted to thank the Board of Health for, for taking on this uh, uh, really challenging issue and, and coming forward with a, a comprehensive list of, of actions for us to consider. I um, want to assure you that uh, uh, the mayors, uh, that I agree with um, the idea that we should once again be pursuing action in Montpelier um, with respect to the issues that were endorsed by Burlington voters several years ago, I think would be better um, and maybe more uh, um, likely to get action in Montpelier if, uh, since there seems to be a, a deep resistance to uh, local action on gun violence issues, um, I, I think it would have an even more comprehensive impact if safe storage, and uh, prohibition of guns in, uh, in bars and restaurants with li where liquor is being served um, and uh, unfinished policy work, although I think some was taken with respect to domestic violence, if there's any further uh, uh, um, policy opportunity there. Um, uh, we, we, I think whether it's giving Burlington the ability to take that action or just making that change on the, on the statewide level, allowing Vermont to join uh, such uh, liberal um, states as, as uh, Alaska and um, uh, I believe Wyoming that have uh, had such prohibitions um, in, the, in the past or all the other New England states that have in place safe storage requirements. Um, I, I think I certainly fully agree that that's uh, action we uh, hope to see from the legislature this year. I look forward to a, a council uh, resolution that endorses that as well, um, as well as other other steps that we can take together to uh, uh, to to turn around this very troubling spike that we've seen this year, and to make Burlingtonians safer. Um, it is it is uh, it, it really makes me angry uh, to think to to see uh, in the details of some of the gun violence that we have seen this year that had the legislature. Um, uh, given us the ability to require safe storage, uh, uh, that that could have impacted some of the crimes that we've seen here. Had the legislature given us the, the uh, authority that we uh, really worked very hard from both voters and then in extensive testimony in Montpelier to prohibit guns and bars, um, perhaps I would have had a positive impact on the 12 late night shootings following bar closings that we've seen uh, uh, over the last couple of years. Um, we had had clear, very troubling incidents with respect to guns in the bars, and before the last couple of years, we shouldn't have had needed this further evidence that such a, such a change was necessary. Um, uh, now that we have this new and uh, fresh evidence of how much this uh, regulation in this area is necessary, let's hope we get a different reaction in Montpelier. Thank you, thank you, Mayor Weinberger. Uh, don't believe that there's anyone else. Um, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Councillor Carpenter. 
Hi, I, I just want to thank you so much for doing this and encourage you to share your resolution with your colleagues in other communities. I think the degree that we can get more communities to adopt this kind of resolution will be helpful. Thank you, Councillor Carpenter. Uh, seeing no one else in the queue, uh, we'll go to a vote. And this would be uh, the motion made by Councillor McGee to refer this resolution to the Public Safety Committee. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. Uh, that motion passes unanimously. Uh, thank you both again, uh, Celia and Jen. Um, and uh, the other members of the Board of Health for your work on this and your service to the city. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, we will move on to item 8.05, um, and I just need to get a chair for, uh, for our uh, assistant city attorney, and just give me a moment. At the dinner table now, by all means. Take a minute. Rush. Rush. So we're moving on to item 8.05, um, and we'll call to order the hearing regarding Orlando's Bar and Lounge outdoor entertainment permit. Uh, the purpose of this hearing is to allow each party the opportunity to present their case, which can include evidence submitted and witnesses uh, they may choose to speak on their behalf. Uh, we'll ask the parties to identify themselves for the record, um, followed by each, um, each party beginning with the complainant who will present their case, uh, and then the respondent who has the opportunity to put on a defense of the allegations. Following the respondent, um, counselors will have the opportunity to ask questions of the parties and witnesses. And after any questions from the council, uh, the hearing will be adjourned and I will announce next steps. Uh, for the benefit of all the parties that are here, we've allotted 30 minutes uh, for this agenda item. And on the advice of legal counsel, Kaylee, Haley, Mc Haley McClanahan, who is sitting here with me, uh, we're able to set a time limit uh, for each side to be heard and have determined that 10 minutes not including questions from the council is reasonable uh, With that we'll set a timer for 10 minutes um, if we can And then invite the complainant to the table we do have to swear you in um, What is the best way to do Okay. If the complainant could come forward and uh, identify themselves for the record, and then uh, the assistant city attorney will swear you in. Certainly. Uh, my name is Holly Bushnell, and I'm the complainant. Do you want to, if you want to reserve 10 minutes to inquire Uh, so what we're talking about is just being able to have enough time uh, for either party if they wish to offer have any rebuttal um, And we'll we'll give you two minutes for that at the end So the ten minutes will be the ten minutes if you have witnesses that are here That's part of the ten minutes um, and then if there's we will do that obviously at the end um, Is there anything else? Can you raise your right hand for me, please? Do you swear or affirm the testimony that you are about to give to the council relative to the matter under consideration tonight will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. And if you could just go ahead and say your first and last name for our record. Certainly. It's Holly Bushnell. 
So I think with the president's permission, you can start whenever you're ready. Okay. Yes, please go ahead. All right. Um, I uh, took the opportunity to prepare a packet of information for the council before um, arriving tonight, and I do thank you for having that opportunity to send it in advance and for your consideration this evening. Um, in that packet, I included an introductory letter which explains much of the situation as well as rebutting some of the information provided in a letter from uh, Brandon Mossman, the owner of Orlando's. Um, it also includes information on, uh, it includes copies of all of their entertainment permits, which include uh, applications, which uh, has their requested hours, um, a former sworn complaint or a, a additional sworn complaint um, from a gentleman named Matt Paradise, who was my neighbor across the street at 115 Pine Street, um, copies of my sworn complaints, uh, information from uh, the license committee meeting minutes um, uh, regarding this issue uh, to give you a full background on what has gone on in the license committee. And I believe um, also recently submitted uh, was a, another um, uh, piece of uh, testimony from um, my downstairs neighbors. Um, I know that was posted to board docs uh, just before the meeting, so I'm hopeful that you are all able to take a look at both the information that I provided and the new testimony from uh, my neighbors from downstairs. Um, essentially, uh, what's been going on is um, a long-term back and forth uh, where uh, permitted hours have been very clear for Orlando's Bar and Lounge for the past three years and, uh, or two years rather, my, my apologies, and uh, we are into the third year now. And uh, while there has been improvements in their ability to cease their music on time, it continues to be extraordinarily loud and it continues to not end within the permitted hours on a semi-regular basis. Um, I am not the only person who has issues with uh, Orlando's. My neighbors in my building have had problems with them since the, or problems with the entertainment rather, not with them individual, uh, individually, but with their entertainment um, since uh, the beginning of the pandemic. Um, that is actually the first moment when uh, entertainment was allowed um, on a nightly basis in that area. Um, it had never been permitted before uh, or that specific area had never been permitted before, it is a right-of-way, um, and the stage does block that right-of-way. Um, I think the thing that I most want to say to council is, or want to point out to council is that uh, this entertainment started as part of a COVID-19 pandemic uh, program to help bars and restaurants uh, through that difficult time period. And while it was a great program, uh, most pandemic uh, programmings have ended and I would like to urge the council to end this one as well. Um, I have also asked a, uh, another member of the community um, who I know has had um, a negative interaction with Orlando's and their business practices to speak tonight as well. Um, and I would like to ask Thea Lewis to come forward and, and give council testimony. So before you start, I'm just going to ask that we swear you in and put you under oath. Okay. Will you raise your right hand, please? I will. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give relative to the cause under consideration before the council tonight will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. And could you just say your first and last name for our record, please? Thea Lewis. So I actually had a prepared statement because I thought I'd be doing this. Um, at the beginning of the meeting in public forum. So I own the tour company Queen City Ghost Walk, and over the last 20 years, we've brought countless numbers of people into the city to hear Burlington's ghostly history. Uh, even though we have no brick and mortar store, we, uh, I think, are an important part of the community. People who come to our tours come uh, also to shop and to dine in the city of Burlington. So um, th there are so many wonderful pieces of our history, like the story of Gideon King, who was an 1800 shipbuilder who once owned the American Flatbread Building. It used to be a favorite stop on our tour. Used to be, being the operative term. Historically, establishments on Lawson Lane have cheerfully coexisted with our tour, 
I mean, for two decades. Um, and we used to stop by a few evenings each week, particularly in our busy season, which is mid-September through the end of October. Until a chilly night last October, 2021, when I entered the courtyard with no bands or tables in sight. We were in the center of the right of way, uh, I and my group, and I began to tell the story of Gideon King, but was interrupted by a man who approached from the doorway of Orlando's and told me to leave. I explained that we were in a right of way I'd been using for nearly 20 years at that point, and that I would go when my three minute story was over. But he reiterated his demand, stating I was on private property. When I didn't leave, he moved to the doorway of the club, watching while greeting customers until we exited the space. This year, on a very different tour, I discovered Orlando's seating area blocked a passage from the stairs behind the building, um, to, uh, and that is um, a stairway that is uh, an iron stairway that goes up behind Flatbread, up behind Orlando's. Um, so the passage was blocked by all of the tables, and there was no way for me to take my tour across the right of way um, without disturbing patrons, which I would never do. Um, I reconfigured my tour and then made a call to the city to clarify the boundaries of the right of way, but that was inconclusive. So I went to the club's website, hoping to find the name of somebody I might discuss the situation with. Um, what I found was that <laughs> I, I don't, it, it's not really humorous, but it did make me laugh and I was, I just couldn't believe it. Um, I uh, looked at Orlando's uh, webpage, and the homepage is using a pirated version of the city of Burlington logo as their own. Um, yeah, it's crazy. Um, in his plea to the city council dated October 24th, 2022, Orlando's owner, Mr. Mossman, reminded the city it's critical to be supportive of small businesses. But I feel like he only means his small business. Since I'm not allowed in the right of way, and since the noise from his bands drowns out other sounds, um, there are many nights when I can't tell my story at Vermont Pub and Brewery because of the noise coming from the right of way there at Orlando's. Um, you know, uh, Mr. Mossman's responses regarding his violations in his letter to the council leave me feeling that he's gotten used to operating on the belief that it's easier to ask forgiveness than permission. And so I just, you know, I, as a small business owner who complies with the rules uh, as they're set out for me, um, I'm just completely befuddled and disturbed by this. So thank you for hearing me tonight. That was actually uh, the entirety of what I presented. Um, I do, again, really just hope that you folks had an opportunity to take a look at uh, the documents that are uploaded to Board Docs. Um, they really do provide all of the detail for the situation, and I was hoping to spare your time in person by giving you a little bit in, of more information than you probably needed in advance. So thank you very much for your consideration, and uh, I will leave the last two minutes. Uh, to, uh, Great. Thank you, Ms. Bushnell and uh, Ms. Lewis. We will now uh, set the timer for 10 minutes and uh, with that invite the respondent to the table um, to put forward their case uh, in defense of the allegations. And again, before you begin, uh, the assistant city attorney will swear you in um, and any witnesses that you may have. Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give to the council tonight relative to the cause under consideration will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. Thank you. And could you just say your full name for our yes, record, Yes, Brandon please? Mossman. Um, so I'm a little upset about this whole situation. Um, I have a permit. I have a consumption permit to sell alcohol on my patio until 2 a.m. Councillor Shannon stated in the last meeting that I was violating that. That was false, okay? I did not violate that. My permit goes till 2 a.m., okay? Second of all, we provide live music to Burlington, okay? We have a patio we opened during COVID. I opened this business eight months before COVID, and when COVID hit, we had no other option to do anything but open the patio. Now, because of this, we have built our brand on the patio. We've built it with live music, art. 
we've put ticketed events. Our first ticketed event, we donated the proceeds to the Howard Center, okay? I mean, this is, the, the, I, I'm just very frustrated with this, and, and with the, the complainant, the second complainant about the, um, her business with the, the tours, that in fact is private property. It's not a throughway. It's a private property between all three building owners that have a, they have a agreement between it of what times that they are allowed to have tables out there. It includes flatbread. It includes the building that is on the front of College Street that is owned by um, uh, his, Nick, who I also was gonna get a letter from as well. I haven't gotten it in time. I was gonna put it on the board docs, but I haven't got it yet. Um, and the Bennington Potters. Our stage is placed there. We have an agreement with the Bennington Potters people. They are okay with it. The one loss of lane owners and the flatbread. Our business not only benefits us, it benefits the musicians, our staff, okay? Flatbread, the Blue Cat, which is another restaurant that benefits from our music. And it, it's, we're being attacked by this. I hope you guys all read the letter I sent in to each council member individually. I sent it to the mayor. I put letters of recommendation with 50 signatures I got in one day of musicians that perform there. And I'm, I'm just, I just don't understand how, we're, we're in a downtown district. We're in the same district as Church Street, the map that I attached here goes all the way down to Battery Street. That is the downtown district and we're right in the heart of it. We should be given the same opportunity to do business as everybody on Church Street, okay? And it's unfair, it's discriminatory, and I'm very, I'm just, I'm just infuriated with the fact that we have even come to this point when there's all this other crime in the city that's going on right now you allocated 15 minute times to gun crime, but 30 minutes to this with one complaint? There's one comp current complaint. The complaint from 2020 was before we bought a $7,500 sound system to help with the decimal levels, okay? This is, I mean, this is, it's, it's very, it's a simple situation, it's a business, we're in the downtown district. We should be given the same opportunity to do business as another business across the street, which I pulled the permits from, and their permit to do outdoor live music goes to 12.30 p.m. Or 12.30 a.m., rather. And I've got witnesses here. I've got regular customers that enjoy live music. I've got people that perform bands. I've put letters in from bands that Ms. Bushwell accused of playing late, which aren't true, okay? They have spelled out the terms. They've played here multiple times throughout the summer, and the cutout is 11 p.m. It, you know, it's a live music. Things go over the time limit. It's unintentional. It's unintentional, and the point of the matter is if we were given the same exact permit that I had requested that you have given other businesses on Church Street that do the same live music, that host the same bands that play there, we would not even be having this meeting right now. And this is a calendar of the meetings and the bands that we've had, the times they've ended. I was gonna put this on the dock, but I just printed it out right before we got here. And I mean, are you guys really gonna shut down a local business that has 15 employees that we opened pre-COVID for outdoor live music and give arts because one person is currently complaining because we went over 20 minutes? You're gonna shut down a business because of that because if you pull this permit, this business will end. And because it doesn't suffice, it can't survive without the patio. And I'm just frustrated with the whole matter and that's essentially where we're at. That's essentially where we're at. So if you guys pull the permit, we shut down. It doesn't affect just me. It affects the 50 people that signed this waiver 
that play music that we pay to play there. It affects the 15 employees I currently have. It affects me that spent the past five years doing this and creating a patio during COVID. We stayed open. We were the only place that could possibly try to stay open, and we did, and we managed to do it with the patio. And it wasn't just me that created it. It was the 50 people that signed this, this form, 50 other people that play music, they don't just come, and they're not just local, they come from afar, they come from Massachusetts, Connecticut. Visitors of the city come to our patio to enjoy live music, and that's what we do. We have live paintings. We, we do t private ticketed events. Flatbread benefits from it, and, they all, and we communicate with them what music we have, what time it starts, what time it ends, so they can tell their customers. So I want to just invite a couple of the musicians up that play and uh, one of my regular customers. If you want to give us the word, you can probably take those. I don't know if you want to just submit that or sure. something for dramatic effect. So, what's your name, last one? Hello. Will you raise your right hand, please? Do you swear or affirm that the testimony that you're about to give relative to the matter under consideration by the council tonight will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? I do. And can you say your full name for our record, please? Yes, uh, Joshua West. Um, so thank you for uh, giving us this platform to speak. Um, I'm here on behalf of both Orlando's bar and also um, the musicians of Burlington and also musicians of uh, kind of New England. Um, I'm actually a transplant of Burlington. I grew up in Plattsburgh, New York, across the lake. Um, first started coming to Burlington to see live music when I was in high school over there, and was very inspired um, just by the culture and the musical opportunities and outlets that Burlington provided, uh, more so than my hometown of Plattsburgh. Um, I recall being probably a junior in high school, about 16 years old, uh, coming over for a Burlington Jazz Fest and actually seeing music in this patio um, area outside Flatbread and what is now Orlando's, I believe it was Magnolia's back then, um, providing shows all throughout Jazz Fest and actually spent a good amount of time year after year since then seeing music in this patio that's under discussion. Um, and after attending SUNY Plattsburgh, I decided to move to Burlington um, to Vermont for the first time because of the musical opportunities and outlets that this community and this city provided, um, you know, more so than, than the town of Plattsburgh and um, all the opportunities that that could lead to, um, which has led to me being able to become a full-time professional musician. I play in a number of bands um, based out of Vermont and New York and, and tour nationally um, now that uh, the pandemic has slowed down at least. Um, but I just want to speak to, uh, you know, the pandemic on that note really provided a struggle for all sorts of businesses um, and for musicians. You know, I'm a business owner myself. I, I own a couple bands and uh, manage a couple bands. And it was incredible the, the hardships that musicians faced during that time um, are still facing coming out of it. And um, a place like Orlando's that was able to, you know, kind of face what are we going to do? Are we going to shut down? or can we provide an outdoor opportunity for music to kind of still thrive um, and people could gather in small numbers and spaced out safely. Um, it allowed um, a safe place for musicians to, to both, um, you know, work on their, their craft and continue their job, um, but also to continue to pay their rent. Um, and I know a number of musicians from out of state, you know, that would hole up in their house for a week or 15 days, whatever the guideline was at the time, and, and make sure that they, um, you know, I'll, I'll wrap this up quickly, uh, you know, reached, reached a safe space, passed a couple negative tests so that they could travel here to also bring their craft to the city. And it's, it's been an amazing thing that this um, club has provided. Thank It'd be a shame to see it go. It directly affects us all. And thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mossman, if you do have um, items that you wanted to uh, have submitted, you can do that this evening if you have items that you wanted to give to Lori and just yeah, ran out of time. 
Well, I'm just asking if you have it. If you, I'm just letting you know. We we will have an opportunity for rebuttal. Um, Ms. Bushnell, if, is there anything that you would like to offer uh, for in the couple of minutes that remain, and then we'll come back to you, Mr. Mossman. Yes, I would like to just uh, briefly bring the council's attention to a couple of things. Um, in Mo Mr. Mossman's testimony, he stated that the cutoff time is 11. It's not. Uh, the cutoff time is 11 p.m. on Friday nights and Saturday nights. The cutoff time is 10 p.m. 10:30 p.m. on all other nights. This seems to be the sticking point, as Thursdays tend to go to 11 o'clock. Um, that seems to be, if you look at the information that I provided in uh, my letter, that seems to be the night where things go the latest. And I would just like to point out, you know, things do happen. I uh, previously worked at music festivals um, for 13 years, um, and I know music goes over all the time. All of the dates that I provided with time overages was when a band started playing an encore after 11 p.m. I'm totally fine if you go over two minutes here, three minutes there, when your last song's going too long. I understand that happens. It's when you deliberately start playing another song after 11 p.m. that I took offense and I, that I felt like they were being deliberately um, deliberately ignoring the guidelines, which they requested. They requested these hours in their entertainment permit application, which they sent to the uh, council uh, and ultimately was approved by the license committee and the full council. This is something they agreed on and they're not able to stick with it. And I do question how many times going over your hours, 20 minutes here or there, becomes negligence and stops being unintentional and accidental. So I think that's all I needed to say. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Mossman, if you wanted to have two minutes to re for rebuttal, yeah. you're welcome to. I, I did not request the um, 10.30 and 11 p.m. I actually requested the same permit as another local business, which was 12.30 p.m. And that is what the other permit had. If, if you could just sit down just so we can hear you. Yeah, the, I, that's not true. I didn't request those hours. Those were the hours that were given to me. I requested the hours of another similar business that is a block away from us, which is 12.30 p.m. And I pulled that permit, and that is exactly what you guys as a council gave that business. I don't understand why one, bur one business that is one block away in the downtown district gets the opportunity to do business where I can't do business in those hours. And that, that is basically the, the bottom line. It's biased, it's discriminatory to our business, and it's just, it's just it's not fair. And I actually said this to Councillor Shannon when she came down to do her investigation, and she told me, quote, life isn't fair. And I will swear on that, and I have witness here to that conversation that she did say that to me. Thank you. Thanks. So to counselors, uh, you'll now have the opportunity to ask questions of the parties and witnesses. Uh, are there counselors that have questions? Councilor Carpenter, and if you could just identify to whom and we'll have them come up. Um, thank you. Uh, to Mr. Mossman, do you have a manager on site or somebody whose responsibility it is to tell the band to bands to stop playing at 10.30 or 11? Yeah, so we do have a sound engineer. Um, we don't have one every night because it's hard to find people to work in this industry right now. We have a door guy at, who I have right now, our main door guy that works every weekend, and he is in control of the patio. And most nights we are okay and we do abide by the rules. It's not intentional that the bands go over. The bands have set lists. They don't intention when they're playing music, they don't intend they're all aware of the eleven PM cutoff. They don't intend to go over that. You know? And sorry, and on Wednesday, Thursday is ten thirty. But that's not an intentional thing that happens. It just happens. It's the nature of the business, the nature of live music. And, you know, I'm usually, I personally sit up in the lobby and host and help with Tom, and he can attest to that. But lately, because we are so understaffed right now, I've been having to bartend because we can't find people to work right now. 
And I've been down in the bar a lot of the nights, and I've been having to bartend and make drinks for the servers for the patio, and I haven't been able to be up there, but that's because we can't find people to work right now. And that's the problem. A lot of our servers don't want to work anymore because they can only sell alcohol out there till 11 p.m. when our permit is till 2 a.m., but no one wants to sit up there in silence. <laughs> they can't. When the bands, when we shut down, and we can hear bands from Church Street blasting down the alleyway, but we have to shut down, and servers don't want to work there anymore because they can, tip, they can only sell drinks for three hours while the bands play. So we're understaffed. It's a whole problem. We should be given the same opportunity as any other business in Burlington to sell live music and drinks and food as another business. I mean, it's, it's just, it's that simple. It's, it's not, there's no other area. That would be essentially like telling Flatbread they can sell alcohol till midnight, but we can sell till 2 a.m. I mean, it's a permit. Everybody should be given the same opportunity in Burlington as a small business as another business. We've never had a violation from the DLC. We've never had a violation from the fire marshal. We've never had a pol the police there. We've never had a fight. We've never had an instance of overconsumption. We've never had any tickets, nothing. No, no um, noise violations, nothing. And it's just, it's just, it's basically, I'm, I'm sorry that I'm getting a little frustrated, but I feel like this is like a personal vendetta against me when I run a clean business and I've done absolutely nothing wrong. Yes, I have had a band go over. It was unintentional. It wasn't what I planned to do. It's not like, it's not like it was an intentional circumstance where we're playing and we're talking about periods of 10 15, 20 minutes, it'd be one thing if it was 2 a.m. we were blasting speakers out there. We're not doing that. We're not doing that. Uh, Councillor Carpenter, was there anything else? That, any other questions or of, the, of any other witnesses or the other party? No? I can't see you. No. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, are there any other councillors who have any questions? of any of the, either of the parties or witnesses. Uh, Councillor Barlow. Uh, thank you, President Paul. And thank you, Mr. Mossman. Um, I had a question about, <clears throat> we, we, you had uh, said that it was the nature of the business and bands run over. Is there, are there any ways you could, um, you know, be more um, proactive about ending on time? Yeah, if, if we were given the same, same permit as the business across the street that goes till 12 30 p.m. We wouldn't even be having these meetings right now. But, but within the limits of your current permit, could you could you end on time? Are there things yeah, additional I mean, things I, you could I do? Could go out there and rip the plug out of the speakers if they're going two minutes over. If that's really what it takes for me to do. But you know, it's a live band. They're doing a performance for a full patio. People are enjoying it. People travel to come see it. If that's really what it's necessary for me to do, I will do that, but at the same time, I should be given the same permit as a business across the street, and I don't want to throw any other businesses under the bus. I mean, you guys all know the permit that I'm talking about. It's just, it's just I don't understand why we, as a business that has never had any violations in, on any manner, can't get that same exact permit. It's discriminatory. It really is. And I, I really, I really am upset about it. You know, because I've worked very hard for this business. I'm there every single day, open to close. And there's a lot of people, musicians, employees, staff that have been there for a while that do the same. And the fact of the matter is, if this permit's full, it all ends. Because the, the patio is the brand of the business at this point. COVID did that, that's the brand. That's what, what has become, that's what it is, that's what everyone comes to us for. And that's basically is the fueling factor of the business. No, I thank you and I appreciate that extra context you provided, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Barlow. Are there any other councillors with questions? Uh, Councillor Travers. It's a question for you, Mr. Mossman. Uh, I, I'm mindful of the fact that maybe your patio season does not go all year round, so I'm wondering if you could suggest to us, um, is there a certain time with winter coming up that you plan on 
shutting down the patio or do you plan on keeping it open? We already shut our patio down. We shut it down about a month ago. It's not even open. I mean, granted, the weather is, is nice enough for us to do it, but because of the, this whole situation and the fact that our permit, we, we just are staying away from it because we don't, you know, we don't want to cause any more trouble. And we're not causing trouble, and we never have caused trouble to begin with. When do you normally sh shut your patio down? We usually shut it down basically when it snows. Okay. And, and when last year we stayed open through this month, but we haven't kept it open because of this whole situation at hand right now. Okay. And but for this situation, would you have any plans, or did you have any plans for this winter to keep the patio open in any respect with no, heaters or what have you? We open it basically in the springtime and close it in the fall. Okay. I mean, we play it by year. The weather patterns are not very consistent in Vermont. All right. And you understand that regardless of what the council does with respect to your existing outdoor entertainment permit, which my understanding is the only thing before us right now, is your entertainment permit and not your liquor license, yes. um, that you would have to, regardless of that, come back to the license committee and the council for a renewal of your permit next year. For an entertainment permit. Yes. You understand that, right? Yes, I mean, we renew it each year. Okay. I have no other questions. Yeah, Thanks. no, we, we have renewed it in the past few years, yes. Okay. Great. Thank you, Councillor Travers. Uh, are there any other? Uh, Councillor Shannon. Um, thank you, President Paul. So in our um, packet of information, there is... Uh, some, I actually don't know where this came from, and maybe somebody can tell me. Perhaps Ms. Bushnell put it on, put it as part of the packet. It's not clear from how it appears. But it says, um, sound improvements for summer 2021. We are working with a sound engineer to build a collapsible stage to include ample back soundboard to take into consideration the complaints of the past from neighbors at the end of the Lawson Lane alleyway. Um, I, do, I do remember that we were told this. I don't know where this particular thing was uh, excerpted from. It could, could I have Ms. Bushnell just respond to that? Sure. Uh, that was from the uh, license committee hearing in um, 2020, I believe, uh, November or December. Okay, and I think it may have come forward to the full full council because mm -hmm. I remember it and I don't believe I was on the license committee, subcommittee at the time. Um, so, Mr. Mossman, can you tell us what happened with this? Yeah, so I came before the board um, for extended time permits once I found out that another similar business was 12.30 p.m. And... Um, I said that if I was granted the permit to have live music out there equivalent to that, their permit, um, I would invest some money because um, for soundboard and soundboard treatment, but I was denied that permit. Um, do you have anything mentioning? But on, on, um, on another note, just this past season, not um, just basically as a courtesy to our neighbors and flatbread and other businesses in the area to control the sound volume, we purchased a brand new wireless sound system with all new speakers, monitors, it controls the decimal levels better. We can walk around and control the volume. We don't have to run up to the sound system like we used to because that's what we did originally when we opened. We basically threw speakers out on the patio hook bands up to speakers and play. Now we have a full sound system. We have a sound engineer every night. And yeah, so those are some improvements we have done. So um, how would we know that these sound in per the, the, it looks to me and my memory as well is that you had pledged to us that you were going to, um, to create this uh, collapsible stage and with the soundboard in order to address what you acknowledged was a noise problem in the area. Yes. And how would we know that that was 
conditioned on you getting hours that I don't actually know where the evidence is that you requested a permit for 1230. I, I don't see that. That was the last meeting I had before this council was to, to go to, and I actually didn't even apply to 1230. I mentioned another business had the permit for 1230. I actually only applied for 12 p.m., but I was denied. You guys denied me that permit. We have, um, does Mr. Mossman have all of the documents that we have on board doc, board docs? Is it, does, I mean, he said they're publicly available and I think that the clerk circulated everything she'd received by close of business today. Okay. Um, cause there is a permit on there where I'm actually not completely clear if 10 o'clock was changed to 11 o'clock or 11 o'clock was changed to 10 o'clock. This is the um, May 2020 to April 2021 entertainment permit application. And what comes before the board, we can see what the permit request is. And then sometimes it's changed. I mean, if you go on the YouTube channel, you can, I actually watched the video a couple days ago. The whole council meeting is on YouTube where I do request to go to midnight and it was denied. Did you just verbally request that? Um, I No, I came before the board and it was denied, yeah. But in the written application, did you request that? Uh, yes, I, I, I made a written application. That's why it was come before this committee and there was a meeting about it. Uh, Chip Mason was on that committee. Um, there were other council members. Jack Hansen was on that committee who in <coughs> fact just played the bar patio a couple months ago. So that's actually not true. We never got permitted to go to 11.30 p.m. We were still bumped down to 11 and 10.30 p.m. Okay. Um, so did you at any time tell the um, license committee or the, the full, either the subcommittee of three people or this board, which is the whole license committee, that you would only be building um, those new sound features if you were given longer hours that extended beyond the applications that we have before us and beyond the permit that was given. Yes, because we currently had a permit to play from 10.30 on weekdays and 11 p.m. on weekdays. And my proposal was that I would invest money into some sound dampering equipment if I was granted the opportunity to play music till midnight, and I was denied that. But besides the matter of that, I still invested money in a sound system, not only for, for our customers, but for other businesses and other people surrounding us, such as the Blue Cat Flatbread, and basically our clientele, because it, it helps the sound levels to be more muted and more controlled for everybody. Not only do we benefit from the music, Flatbread benefits from it, Blue Cat benefits from it. Passerbys from the city walk and they stand at the top and they observe the, the live entertainment. I mean, this isn't just like an us business, it's kind of like a community. We so if we can just stick to the questions that, that I ask you at this point, I'd appreciate it. So um, we don't have any information that says you weren't going to build that unless you got longer hours. Did I, in what form did you I provide came that information? I this committee and 
I was denied the permit to go to midnight. And I said, if I was granted that permit, I would invest the money to do this. And I was denied it. You guys denied me of it, the permit. And I was stuck with 10, 30, and 11. And I, I come to find out that other businesses across the street are given the permit to do 12, 30. That's the whole point of this conversation, is that I'm not granted the same opportunity as the businessman next to me to do business. And that's the problem. We're okay. in a downtown district. I attached the map of the downtown district that goes all the way down to... Mr. Mossman, Mr. Mossman. No, we, under we understand that. I mean, we just want to just sort of limit the answer to the question at hand. Um, Councillor Shannon, was there anything else that you wanted to ask? I'm all set, thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, Councillor Bergman. Um, just would like to hear from both parties, so the complainant and uh, the, the bar, when in the spring you resume outside um, music? So usually we basically staff up um, I would say end of March, April time to, to start the pattern. We start hiring people because we need servers up there because we have cocktails. So just, just uh, so with, without getting into all the bloody details, yeah. um, to just when when your outside entertainment, your amplified music or other music uh, happens in the springtime. Yes, correct. And that in March, April, and in April? Is it? Yeah, April. April, okay. And uh, is that, from your standpoint, accurate? I'm not asking for a specific date, obviously, so. May 7th, but, but April, okay. Thank you very much, I have no other questions. Great, thank you, Councilor Bergman. Uh, Councilor Chang. <clears throat> yes, um, thank you, President Paul. And I wanted to ask a question about process first. So oh, okay. we are hearing from both sides, and then once it's closed, what's next? Uh, then what I will do is um, uh, announce that the matter will be taken under advisement, according to VSA, um, and I can read that off. But we will go into a deliberative session pursuant to 1 VSA 312E, um, e, and we'll be issuing a written decision uh, to the parties within 30 days. Okay, wonderful, thank you. I think that's sure. very helpful. So, sure. So that's actually a little bit of a conflict for me because my lease ends December 1st for my business and if this permit's pulled, I'm, I have to close the business down. Okay. I can't survive uh, functioning without the patio and without the live entertainment because that's what we built our brand on you know, for our customers and everything. So that essentially is what's going to happen. Yeah. Well, we will we will certainly be cognizant of that. Um, are there any other? Uh, yep. Councillor Zhang, please go ahead. Yep. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> thank you for being here, and thanks for your letter. And I'm sorry that you were not able to submit your paper, because I think those are relevant, too, so that we read them all and have a better understanding, I think. Um, any way we can do that, I think it will be better. You, you can submit those as well, please. Oh, yeah. um, but I wanted to circle back also to let you know that may, she may not be the only complainant. There are also all the letters that we have received about your business and some behaviors that are not relevant to the permits that you receive. I just wanted you to understand that too. Um, and also to say, that um, this is, and also to ask the license committee first, why was his business not given um, the equitable time closure than another business that's just one block away? Who can recall why there is discrepancies between those two? Why was he denied? Uh, okay, um, I think the First. Chair of the License Committee probably was Councillor Mason, but Councillor Shannon, if you know, that would be great. Well, I, um, I think we did have some discussion at the full License Committee Board, so 
when this came up, I was not a member of the license committee, but I would just say kind of generally um, how the license committee works is we, we do look at the individual establishment, we look at the individual circumstances um, uh, to determine the, uh, the appropriate hours for any given establishment. And also, I would draw your attention to there, there are a lot of minutes in our packet. Yep. Um, so back in August 8th, 2020, um, the license committee, uh, there was a sworn complaint back in August 2020 um, for Orlando's. There was a motion to, um, motion. it says motion to urge the establishment to adhere to current entertainment permit hours with end time of 11 p.m., for a 60 day probation period. Should there be further complaints, a public hearing will be scheduled. Um, the motion was made by uh, Jane Stromberg, seconded by Jack Hansen. Um, that made it unanimous as they were the only two there. Uh, so there is, um, the, and then on October 14th, um, we have a note, Matt Paradis expressed his frustration with the volume of the music coming from Orlando's bar and lounge over the course of the summer, stating that it is affecting his quality of life, sleep, and inhibiting his ability to teach over Zoom to his students, as his students can't, can't, can hear the bands over his voice. He has to use headphones. Um, Sean Beauvais states that his organization attempted to contact Matt Paradis to discuss the issue separately to hopefully avoid going to a hearing. So we have, um, there's a lot of minutes here and there's a long history that had um, led to this. I don't actually recall and perhaps another um, member might recall, I don't recall recall a recent um, request for later hours, but um, maybe somebody else does. So <clears throat> basically, and this was going to be my next question, and it's to you, was Orlando the same business that you complained about a couple months ago or last year? I remember you coming here. Yes. It was the same Orlando. Yeah. Thank, yeah, thank you. All right, and Mr. Uh, Blossom, right? Yes. I also wanted to circle back about the letter you sent to the city council. It seems a city councilor come, came to your establishment to do some type of investigation. And I wanted to know, was this recent? Was it about this complaint, or was, this, was that before? So to my understanding, what happened was uh, it was during the summertime. I don't remember the exact date. But uh, Councilor Shannon um, came to my establishment um, again, I was short staff, so I had to bartend that night. I was down at the bar. Um, I stepped away from the bar to come. Can you use a microphone, yeah, please? Yeah, I stepped away from the bar to come up to the lobby to speak with her in a cordial manner. And um, the band wasn't playing. The band had ended at 11, in which it did. Um, her complaint was that <clears throat> she said that someone had complained about, I mean, we know who the complainant is at this point in time, that someone had complained and that's why she was uh, coming to investigate. But the fact of the matter was, we weren't playing music, live entertainment at, after 11 p.m. We had a, a one speaker 
from our house music, the same music we play inside the bar for our customers on the patio. The same customers, why, why are we granted permit, permitted from um, the liquor committee to sell alcohol till 2 a.m. on the patio when we have to sell it in silence to our customers? Why are we not given that permit when every other business on Church Street is given that permit? Church Street, we've got Red Square, Reraz, right here, apartment buildings, brand new 60 unit apartment Joe Handy just built. M Mr. Mossman, again, Thank if you. you can just yes. stick to the question, please. Well, I'm trying to answer the question thoroughly. Yep, no, my question was specific about the time in which that investigation from a consular to your establishment. Yes. You said it was the summer, and yes. it was not about this specific complaint in front of us. I believe it was about this, well, it was about this uh, same complaint. Okay, wonderful. Thank you. And Kali, do you have something to add? Wonderful. Um, I do not have further questions, and um, thank you. Thank you all. Great. Thank you, Councillor Chang. Uh, we're over our 30-minute limit, so uh, if there are no other councillors with questions, we will um, adjourn this hearing, and the matter, as I had mentioned, will be taken under advisement. The council will be entering into deliberative session pursuant to 1 VSA 312E, and will issue a written decision to the parties within 30 days. Um, thank you to the parties for being here this evening. Uh, can I just say one more thing real quick? Yep. Um, so when Councillor Shannon came down. No, I, no, 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 that I, you can't. If there's some point of clarification, you've had that opportunity and you have been asked questions okay. and you've given those answers with them, the hearing is adjourned. Okay. Thank you. If you want to submit the forms that you have, papers that you have with you, we're happy to take that now. Uh, our last item on our deliberative agenda is 8.06, which is an ordinance, Chapter 14, Solid Waste, Article 1, in general update of the solid waste and recycling requirements regarding separation, storage, and collection. Uh, for this item, uh, once again, I'll turn to the Chair of the Ordinance Committee, Councillor Travers. And I um, did want to note also that uh, I do believe we have Director... Um, hmm. Not sure if we do. Director, uh, DPW Director Chapin Spencer with us. Um, maybe not. Uh, Councillor uh, Travers. Uh, thank you, President Paul. Uh, I would uh, move to waive the reading and adopt the ordinance as amended by the Ordinance Committee. I would ask for the floor back upon a second. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, oh, um, uh, thank you for that uh, motion. Uh, is there a second to that motion? Seconded by, uh, just a moment. Seconded by Councilor McGee. Uh, Director Spencer is here, and we've just promoted him. I believe he should be on. Yes, there he is. Uh, uh, Councilor Travers. Well, I'm, I'm glad Director Spencer is here. Um, we are here uh, in large part because of the uh, good reasons that have been put forth by uh, his department uh, with respect to uh, the proposal. I think a number of us have, have heard those reasons, but Director Spencer, uh, if, if you'd like to uh, sort of give us a reminder and take an opportunity to speak to folks as to the reasoning for this, uh, it'd be great to hear from you. Great. Thank you, Councillor Travers. Um, we were pleased to work with the Ordinance Committee uh, to address two main issues. Uh, one was that uh, we'd been receiving a number of complaints from residents in the city about uh, litter, wind-blown litter, and the recycling that uh, blows from uncovered bins. 
uh, both which uh, clutter the city as well as ruin uh, recyclable resources when they get wet and uh, leave the recycling stream. And two, uh, we have had uh, several injuries from our employees. Uh, the toters have an automatic lift feature on the trucks so that our employees don't need to lift the toters but the bins do not have a similar feature. And as a result, our employees spend a lot of the time lifting the bins that can uh, vary in weight. And uh, we'd like to keep our workforce safe and the city clean. Uh, there are some other cleanup items in the proposed ordinance, but uh, uh, the main item here is requiring toters. And thanks to Councilor Traverse, we uh, proposed an amendment today to, to have the ordinance into effect uh, May, First, 2023, uh, which would give us uh, significant time to work with the public, explain the new requirements, and make sure we can get out all the toters in time before the ordinance goes into effect. Thanks, Director Spencer. Uh, I would just say uh, on the ordinance committee, thank you for uh, Councillor Paul and Councillor Hightower for their work, in particular uh, on um, this. Uh, matter in the ordinance committee. Um, I will just say that uh, there were a couple particular areas that we've heard um, concerns about um, from constituents. You've touched on it somewhat, Director Spencer. Um, I would say that uh, one of them was from uh, community members with uh, mobility concerns. Um, and I certainly appreciate the, the updated language. It existed in there already, but the updated language that's in the ordinance now um, that uh, uh, requires that uh, the department, the city, for those neighbors that uh, do have mobility concerns with respect to uh, using the toters, that um, the city will work with those neighbors to certainly uh, accommodate those concerns. Um, and I don't know if you wanted to speak more to that particular issue, uh, Director Spencer. Yes, uh, when residents contact us uh, seeking additional support for uh, serving their recycling. Uh, we will work with those residents and provide uh, the services necessary to, to make sure they're served. Uh, we run a very thin operation. Uh, we have four, uh, four staff who collect recycling uh, five days a week, and um, we cannot provide uh, backdoor service for everybody in the city. Uh, given our approach, but on a need basis, uh, we are happy to work with individual residents. Uh, and if counselors have any uh, constituents in need of special assistance, please have them reach out to us. Thanks, Director Spencer. And I would just say that the other main concern that we heard were from um, folks who live on streets that have relatively narrow green belts, who particularly during the winter months come close to city plows or city sidewalk plows. Uh, express concerns about uh, toters potentially being uh, damaged, especially during the winter months. And so I certainly appreciate the Ordinance Committee making the effort to uh, add some language in here that would um, obligate the city that in the event um, city equipment or personnel do damage a toter uh, beyond uh, repair of normal, from normal use, uh, that the city would have to replace that toter free of charge for the resident. Um, I suppose there is just one point of clarity here, which is that there is a version of the ordinance that is, is on board docs that would put a May 2023 effective date um, in place for this. Uh, I personally thought that was important because as written for any residents who uh, do not have a toter, well, I certainly expect um, Director Spencer and, and folks at DPW would have been more than reasonable about this. As written, it would immediately put folks who don't have a toter yet um, in violation of the ordinance at issue. So I personally thought that uh, an effective date of, of May of 2023 would allow folks an opportunity to learn about this, to purchase their toters, um, and as well for individuals who have mobility concerns uh, to um, arrange it as needed and as required by the city. Um, so. My intent here was to actually move the version with the effective date of, of May of 2023. I don't know uh, if I've properly done that, to be honest, but <laughs> um, I don't know if an amendment is, is uh, further amendment is in order. I think that's the that's version, that is yeah. the version that's on there. 
Um, so as long as everyone's on board, that, that is the version that's been moved. Okay, I see some nodding heads. That's all I have. Great, thank you, Councillor Travers. Um, are there any other councillors who wish to speak to this ordinance? Uh, seeing none, we will go to a vote on the motion. And the motion was to waive the reading, adopt the resolution as amended by the ordinance committee. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed, please say no. And that motion passes unanimously. And that completes our deliberative agenda. We have just a couple more items, mm -hmm. and that is item number nine, which are committee reports. Are there counselors who wish to offer a committee report? Councillor Bergman. So your, your charter change committee will be bringing back, um, I suspect, at the next meeting, but depending on how full it is, it could get kicked over three um, charter changes. And I have mentioned two of them in reports. First is the all legal resident uh, voting in local elections. Um, we're pretty happy about that and uh, really happy about the work that the um, CETO office and uh, Jillian Natan have has done in terms of the outreach and uh, totally um, appreciate the, the support that we've gotten from uh, Councillor Jang in addition to that. Um, there is um, as well um, pertinent to uh, the uh, redistricting conversation that we had a uh, flexibility in the siting of polling places that we will be bringing back and that I think will uh, make uh, our job a little bit easier, maybe. I think, I don't know if it's actually implicated in the work that we're continuing to do, but at least we'll have that flexibility if there are any questions on that. And the last is the uh, ranked choice voting, which uh, will come back and come back in a form which is consistent with the state statute that was adopted for city councilors that we will be um, seeing um, in effect on the December 6th um, election in the East District. And it will be for the offices of mayor, uh, school commissioners, and ward election officials. I'm not exactly sure that I got that last terminology right, but it would be like the ward clerks and the inspectors of election. So the idea being those are the, 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 the people that we generally elect and um, you know, in the in the course of our March elections, so uh, that those three will be coming back, and uh, with the addition of the uh, redistricting, we will um, hopefully have four um, uh, four charter changes on the March ballot. And I just want to thank uh, Councillors Traverse and Carpenter for really um, hard work. I mean, to get here required us to meet a lot, and we did. And uh, the, I think the quality of the work was excellent, and I just wanna thank them, and, uh, and, and thank all the people um, uh, who weighed in uh, on uh, the, all of the, the items. Very, very helpful and important. Um, thank you. Thank you, thanks, Councillor Bergman. Uh, any other Councillor, uh, Councillor McGee? Thank you, President Paul. Uh, the Public Safety Committee met, I believe, last week. You know, my time is a little warped. Um, we uh, had a great discussion and we've made plans to discuss the draft of the report on the CNA recommendations. Um, we will be scheduling a meeting to begin that conversation and anticipate that to uh, span a few meetings uh, where we'll discuss the timelines that the previous Public Safety Committee uh, and the working group uh, put together, um, discuss the progress that has been made to date and uh, what work um, remains, uh, which is substantial. Um, and I very much thank the previous Public Safety Committee for the exhaustive work that they put into uh, preparing this report um, and look forward to continuing that conversation as well as at our next meeting um, discussing the gun violence prevention resolution. 
Um, so I will have that meeting scheduled soon. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Councillor McGee. Uh, Councillor Travers. Uh, the Ordinance Committee will be meeting on November 22nd at 4.30 p.m. We will be hearing an ordinance referred to us uh, a while ago with respect to vacant buildings. Uh, and now, as of this evening, we'll be uh, taking up uh, TDM and minimum maximum parking requirements. Looking forward to seeing folks there. Thank you. Uh, any, uh, Councillor Jang. Thank you, President. And the racial equity inclusion belonging will be meeting on the 15 at 5.30, Bush Room. And one agenda item we have is to welcome Director Carlson and to understand the committee and the working relationship that we need to establish to support her work. And two... Record. Yep, sorry. Two, the racial... <laughs> um, yeah, two... I don't, we will be, ex, we will be also um, having a discussion about the creation of the Racial Equity, Inclusion and Belonging Commission because it was part of the resolution that created the position and it, was, it tasked the committee to look into it. This is just discussion. Nothing is coming anytime soon. It's just to bring community members to see what, 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 what they think. Um, and also, we will be receiving some updates about the strategic planning uh, for um, that was commissioned by the REIB committee. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Councillor Jang. Uh, any other committee chairs? Councillor Shannon. Thank you, Councillor Paul. Uh, sorry, President Paul. So That's sorry. Quite all right. Um, uh, the PAC committee, Parks, Arts, and Culture Committee, will be meeting on November 30th at 5 p.m. And um, this is going to be our second meeting focusing on public safety in our parks. Um, and we don't have an agenda yet, but that is the basic topic. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Uh I feel like we've covered just about every committee, so we're in pretty good shape here. Um, seeing no others, we'll move on to item 10, which is uh, City Council General City Affairs. Are there councilors who wish to offer comments on General City Affairs? If there aren't any, we can move on to Council President updates. There's only two. The one, first is that we did have one person who has expressed an interest in the reparations task force. Um, if counselors know of anyone um, who is interested or anyone listening who might have an interest, uh, please let me know. And the second is that uh, um, it's sort of a, pretty exciting. Uh, we're going to have a work session at our next meeting on an alternative to board docs. So there's been a there has been some that have gone on. I don't know why we're laughing about that. There are uh, uh, there are a couple of uh, uh, people in the city who have actually um, done the tutorial. We'll get the chance to do that as well, and uh, I think it's pretty exciting because it was one of the things that we uh, discussed at the board retreat, and now we'll have the opportunity to potentially implement. Um, a new program. Um, so more on that as we get closer to the meeting. Uh, that brings us to the final item of the evening, which is item 11, updates from the mayor. Uh, mayor Weinberger, the floor is yours. Thank you, President Paul. Two, two items from May. One, um, this Friday, the VFW will once again be hosting in Battery Park a Veterans Day a ceremony at 11 a.m. and uh, recording in progress would invite the public and and uh, everyone to, to join us uh, for what is always a moving event. Um, looking a week uh, beyond the BTV winter market will be returning to City Hall Park again this year with an expanded uh, footprint. Recording in progress. There will be a um, uh, substantial uh, expansion of the market from, from last year. Uh, the uh, layout goes all the way from, um, uh, from, from College Street uh, 
to the uh, uh, almost all the way to, to, to City Hall, and there will be 20, more than 20 vendors there every week. Uh, the first weekend, looking at the schedule, it starts uh, it's, it's Saturday and Sunday. Uh, after that, um, all the way through Christmas, there are Friday, Saturday, and Sunday hours, and I think the final week there's even a thir some Thursday hours. There'll be um, some uh, ver variety of, of different businesses from week to week. I encourage everyone to check it out. It was a big success last year, and hopefully even more of the public's aware of it this year. And it will be even uh, a more su successful way for many of our new uh, small entrepreneurs to uh, be introduced to the community during the, during the holiday season. That's all I got. President Paul, back to you. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Mayor Weinberger. So that brings us to the end of our agenda. Um, just would ask uh, for a motion to adjourn, uh, moved by uh, Councillor McGee and seconded by Councillor Jang. All those in favor of the motion to adjourn, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? We are adjourned at 1016. Thank you for joining us this evening. Our next meeting is two Mondays from today on November 21st. Uh, I hope you have a good rest of your evening.